Hi, everyone. This is a special episode of Combat Story where I was interviewed on the Team House. And you all know Jack Murphy and David Park, who host the Team House, because we have interviewed them on our program. And we thought it would be interesting to do a crossover where they told my story. So many of you have reached out and asked to hear my story, and I couldn't have thought of a better pair to do that with than Jack and David. So I hope you enjoy this. If you didn't catch the live stream, uh, this should be a lot of fun for you. Thanks. Welcome to Combat Story. I'm Ryan Fugit, and I serve war zone tours as an Army attack helicopter pilot and CIA officer over a 15-year career. I'm fascinated by the experiences of the elite in combat. On this show, I interview some of the best to understand what combat felt like on their front lines. This is Combat Story. Special Operations Covert Ops Espionage The Team House With your hosts, Jack Murphy and David Park Hello everyone, welcome to episode 123 of The Team House. I'm Jack Murphy here with David Park. Tonight our guest on the show is Ryan Fugit who served as a Army Apache attack helicopter pilot and then transitioned over and became a CIA operations officer. Ryan today is also the host of Combat Story, which is another channel on the YouTubes that you can go and find. And if you watch the Team House and you like it, you should really go and check it out right away because I can guarantee you that if you found something here you like, that you'll find something on Ryan's channel that you'll like. Uh, actually, there's an episode that I'm it, Ryan interviews me on, and soon there's going to be an episode where Dave tomorrow, is interviewed. tomorrow, yeah. So um, all your dreams have come true. <laughs> um. <laughs> so yeah, go check it out, and uh, we're gonna you know put Ryan on the other end of the microphone this time around and uh, hammer him with our questions. But before we do that, let's uh, jump into a, a word from our sponsor for the show. Yeah, uh, so uh, Attic Leader ATAC Fitness, uh, this really very soft, very comfortable shirt. Uh, for anybody out there who is planning on uh, training up for any type of special ops, especially water-based ones, or if you're just, you know, trying to get in shape and aren't, you know, looking for a way to do that, one of the best ways to do it is fitting. So um, ATAC uh, sells bundles for uh, uh, rescue swimmer, uh, pararescue, special forces. It's like a one-stop shop kit for yeah. those uh, of you who are and, training up for like BUDS or MARSOC or any kind of like water-based selection program. Uh, honestly, any, I mean, any selection is, is one of the best cardios you can do. Um, and, you know, like one of their bundles here has, you know, the lines, if you're going to do your underwater bowlins, your underwater knots, which a lot of courses require you do, you can practice them underwater. Um, they have a couple different types of masks. They have uh, this one. They also have the uh, high volume mask, which is just a single, you know, a single lens. If you need to learn how to uh, purge your mask, um, which a lot of dive courses require nice snorkels to practice clearing those. And then um, I think that probably the, the big part is these fins that they sell. Uh, they're jet fins, very rigid, curved design, vented, uh, open heel. Um, these are great, great fins for uh, for getting yourself ready for those types of courses because finning will take it out of you. <laughs> like finning, whether it's you know finning for distance or or treading when you have to tread for a, a, a particular. Uh, length of time. And so if you go to ATAC Fitness and you use the code TEAM10, you'll get 10% off your purchase. Yeah. So yeah, check them out. They're great. And they have a partnership with a number of different readiness programs if you're trying to train up for one of those programs. All right, Ryan, back to you. You know what I'm going to ask you right now. Tell us about your origin story, where you grew up, what your upbringing was like, and, and how that sort of set you up on a path that brought you into the army. Yeah, sure thing. I will just say I appreciated how David very casually just tied a knot there like it was no big deal with the rope. So uh, very cool. These are a lot of that was a lot of gear that pilots just never had to touch or worry about. So that was cool to see. For me, I grew up um, kind of weird overseas. I spent my childhood in Zimbabwe in Africa. I wow. was in Pakistan during the first Gulf War. We got evacuated out and brought back afterwards. And I was born in Belgium. So I lived the first 13 years of my life overseas. So, so were um, your folks spies or missionaries? Or gypsies. They were legit 
State Department. Really? So, yeah, so. I, I like how you say that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It, it was the first person I checked out when I got into the agency, when I got to CIA <laughs> to see if my dad was actually in and had been lying to me all this time. And he's a legit state guy. <laughs> yeah. So did he did he look down at on you for no, no, no. He, at, interestingly, he had some really good friends over the years who who ended up being pretty high up at the agency. You just get to be close with folks um, in the State Department when you're at the agency. You're in the same communities in these places where there aren't a lot of Americans. So you get pretty tight. And he had a few of those. And my dad, look, honestly, there's a lot of stereotypes for State Department folks is kind of uh, pencil pushers. They're the policy wonks. But my dad flew Hueys in Vietnam, so he was he was a combat guy from the start. And then he, his true calling was the State Department. He loves to say he was a terrible pilot, although I will say he has a silver star and a DFC, which is no joke. Wow. Um, but he, he really found his calling with the State Department. And he had, a, I think, when he would go and, and work with different uh, military commands and just with the agency, I think they had a lot of appreciation for the time he spent in uniform of sure. course right i think as you as you might expect sure when when you were growing up like that i mean obviously the year the environment that we're in is normal to us but did you did you realize that like your upbringing was different than many than most americans i i did a little bit because we go back every two years maybe for a month over the summer and so that that would be like my taste of what america was and i had no idea. I was literally in Africa, like in the middle of Southern Africa, running around with no shoes, um, very few Americans there. So that, that was what I knew. Occasionally, like a Nintendo game would just drop in when somebody came to visit. But we go back to the States and like I'd go to a ball game in Chicago, like I'd go watch the Cubs play or we'd run around Northern Virginia, seeing friends and family. And that was my exposure to the U.S. and how different it was where I where I was growing up, in particular the third world, right? Yeah. And I know you guys know it better than anybody, how, the stark contrast of the third world to the true first world problems we deal with here sure. in the U.S. And so I certainly, like, I recognized some of those early on, but it certainly wasn't until I came back for high school and we moved to Tampa, Florida for my dad's last role at CENTCOM. And that's where... I really noticed how different my upbringing was compared to everyone else. And how was that for you? I mean, did you have a hard time fitting in? Did you just. I, I didn't, I didn't really, but I think it's because of sports. You know, I think sports can be a huge equalizer for people, whether it's, um, you know, cause you're on a team or you just understand how to do something. And I had never played American sports, but I grew up playing rugby and I swam and, tennis and squash and all these other sports. So I had good coordination and I came in and I started playing football. I ran track. And so I immediately had this group of friends and was accepted because I was pretty good. You know, I was all right at it. Yeah. Um, so I didn't, that wasn't that hard, but I will say like academically, it was much easier coming back to the U S from these like international schools. So, you know, I started out in basic classes and then kind of worked my way up to, to the, the honors programs and, and trying to find my way. But early on, I was able to get in because of sports. And then culturally, like, uh, did you, when you would hear people talk about first world problems, as you said, uh, did, did you have sort of an opinion to that? Or did you kind of adapt to that pretty quickly? I think I adapted quickly. And I will say this, this became really helpful when I was at the CIA, like mm -hmm. trying to assimilate in and being liked and other people liking you and that sort of thing. Like, I think I just picked it up from moving around, especially coming back to the U.S. and trying to make friends. So I tried not to dwell on that. I think the disparity between first and third world problems and I think the frustration a lot of us might have when you've seen what it's really like in these other places mm -hmm. came a lot later. Maybe coming out of the military and getting into corporate America and then the agency. Okay. So I'm sensing that you are a pretty worldly dude as a young man. And your dad being a, a Vietnam veteran and, and helicopter pilot, the, I, am I wrong in sensing that this was sort of the aspirations building within you that sort of took you on that on that route? You, you were not wrong. I, you know, my dad would keep he, he'd have his like little a little case with his 
couple of his medals in it just off to the side. He wasn't ever showing it off or anything. But, you know, I'd see it. I remember seeing it when I was young in Africa and we'd drive around back in the States when we were back home. And I'd ask him to tell me, like, what was Vietnam like? And he would t- he would tell me these stories about flying into hot LZs, just like you see in We Were Soldiers. Like, it's exactly the way he described it um, was how you read about it and see it in that movie. Um, so, yeah, like I kind of had that growing up. I had two older brothers who ended up going into the military, one flew Kiowas, the other was an armor officer. So I think it was a pretty clear path for me that that's what I was going to go do um, coming out of high school, at least, and getting into college. Cool. So what was that like? Did you go in enlisted or you went in as an officer? Yeah, so I went. So my dad was an officer. For whatever reason, that was the route I took going in. Both of my older brothers were. So I did ROTC at Georgetown Mm -hmm. to kind of get my foot in. They paid for school. Thank God, because that place is expensive. Um, I did ROTC there. I I played football there. So I was busy as hell during college, but it was good. You know, it was another group of guys that I got to meet, a whole new set of folks, both on the ROTC side and um, on the football side. And that was the first time, truthfully, I was exposed to NCOs, or like the, the NCOs that were running our ROTC program. And and impressing on us like how important it is to listen to an NCO and like giving us the the non-college side of that experience of what we were getting ready to go into. How how did the NCOs treat you? I mean, did they treat you like recruits? Did they treat you like future officers? They treated us way too, way too well, like way too nicely. You know, like I'm sure it's really tough. You got an 18 year old kid with nothing but tons of opportunity and these guys have come out of you know this was just pre 9-11 so there wasn't a lot of fighting but you know they've had a tough life being in the military and moving and putting up with young lieutenants and here they are faced with like this is the the origin story of these dumbass lieutenants i had to deal with for so long (laughs) and so actually they were really kind and and you could tell they were just trying to impart as much knowledge on you before you left as you could like great example for me you know, you compete when you're in ROTC to get to these, um, some of the courses over the summer, airborne, air assault, dive, whatever. And, you know, I, I worked hard to get into air assault school. I went to that and I still remember this guy, a uh, staff sergeant Roper. He went through my packing list, like every single item. And he came out of the 101st and you guys know, like it's the, the home of the air assault folks. And no kidding, like you stand there on day one, you get all your gear out. You're in these long lines and they just go through your packing list and they're checking for everything and guys get dropped because they don't have it. And I just remember thinking like, how lucky was I that this guy was there looking out for me at that time? And a right. lot of these guys just didn't have that. Right. Wait, was there a was there a reason you went officer instead of warrant? And was there more risk that you wouldn't become a helicopter pilot as an officer? Yeah, so... I never considered warrant. I just didn't know about it. It just didn't come up with my dad, you know, at all, even though he was in the aviation community, he was only in there for a few years in Vietnam. But I was more set on like literally to the, the night before I had to choose what branch I wanted, I ended up picking aviation, but it was down to that in infantry. Okay. And I, I very easily, it's one of the reasons I love doing the show, like talking to you guys who've been on the ground, because that could have been me in a lot of cases. And I think back on that night a lot when I made this decision, all right, I'm going to go the aviation route. And I think back on it because I have a bit of regret, but I would have regretted it either way. You know, right. like my dad flew, sure. I, I can connect with him on a level I never could had I not been in the cockpit flying. Same with my brother. Um but I have a, so much respect for dudes on the ground running around who we were covering when I was up in the air and thinking like that could have been me down there. So that was the reason I went the the officer route was I, I was going to go either of those. The warrant officer track just never came into play for me. So where were you when 9-11 happened? I, I was in Georgetown. So I was in D.C. when it happened. And we had a because I played football, we had early morning like workouts and game review and like from the previous season and, and that season. And I had just come back from that and my I roomed with three other guys on the football team. So I was a senior at the time and they they did not do ROTC. So I was often the dude like coming home as they were 
you know, I was going out the door to do PT as they were coming back from the bars. And so to see them up this early watching TV, I knew something was going on. So we sat down and we were watching it. And then later that day, we all had mopeds because that's the kind of people we were. We drove down so we could see the smoke coming off the Pentagon later that day. And Jack, I can't remember if you and I were talking about this, but I, I remember in the months after that or the weeks after that and months, like every day I'd read the Washington Post about these SF guys riding on horseback out in Afghanistan and how cool I thought that was. And just trying to follow that as, as closely as I could, um, you know, with the internet being what it was at the time. Yeah. Uh, yes. And now you, that you get your shot, uh, to go into the military, as you said, you choose, uh, aviation over infantry. Um, what was it like? Can you tell us a little bit about the kind of like training process to become an Apache pilot? Yeah, I know you guys have had another, at least one AH guy on here. I mean, I went, I commissioned in the summer of 02, and I was, I ask everybody on my show, almost everybody about this, but like for me, the amount of FOMO or whatever you want to call it, like the the absolute fear I had that I was going to miss the war was staggering. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean flight school is like a year long plus that's just kind of for your basic work and then you got to go and do your advanced aircraft and apaches take longer so i was like oh my god i'm going to be here forever this war is going to be over i'm going to be the only dude without a combat patch and obviously now you look back and it's completely naive to have thought that that was the case but at the time yeah. you just don't want to be that guy right coming out without one yeah and and based on you know the first gulf war there was no exactly. reason to think that it wasn't going to be like a quick in and out, you know? Exactly. Exactly. So, so for us, like we go, we go to Fort Rucker. Sorry, David. Go no, ahead. go ahead, please. No, I was going to say we go to Fort Rucker and, you know, it's in, it's in the middle of nowhere in Alabama. You got all these students coming in and we had to wait probably four months, maybe three months to start our training. There was like a backlog of pilots going through the course and so we just sat there and did almost nothing all day for three months. And I was petrified about just waiting any longer. Like I looked up, could I go to the CIA now? What can I go do to get my ass into this war somehow? But I stuck around and I got put into a class. You're in a flight school class of about 30 guys and girls. And I, I was one of two ROTC guys. So it was me and 28 West Pointers. And it was like the 28 West Pointers who have finished one through 28 in their order of merit going, you know, coming out of school that year. They all get to pick like when they want to start class. And this is like the most time you could have off to start was this. So like the people who ranked highest took the most time off in the summer and then started course with me. So I was in there with all these West Point dudes and I'm good friends with a lot of these guys now. But you're with them every day for a year. And every single day is an evaluation. Like you're taking a classroom test, you're in the aircraft flying. It, you know, there's no A pluses. It's either you did this right or you sucked at it. And you're just constantly evaluated over time in these different flight skills. And everybody's competing for an airframe in the end. Do so you, some people really want to go and fly Chinooks, Blackhawks, whatever. We had Kiowas and Apaches, but there are very few gunships that are given out. So it's pretty it's pretty competitive to get a slot um for the for the attack helicopters do you, so it, i was gunning uh, for that do uh, do you fly every airframe while you're in the class no they start you out flying a civilian version of a kiowa so it's it's a bell jet ranger unless you're like six foot five or taller which my roommate there was and they fly hueys which is hilarious like nobody else gets in a huey it's pretty cool to see these things still flying around so he was out flying Hueys while I was in this little uh, jet bell aircraft. And then that's just for like making sure that you're safe in the aircraft flying around. You solo in that. You learn to hover in that. And then when you start doing like low level navigation routes, that sort of thing, they transition you into an older version of the Kiowa. And then you're in that through the end. And then at the end, you go and pick your final airframe and then then you go to a separate course just for that. How, how'd that work out for you? That Did you have to like score at a certain percentile to, because you said it was very competitive to get onto a gunship. 
Yeah. So they, everything, just like the military, there's, you know, an OML that's running around all the time, classroom flights, your, you know, all the grades that you get. And then there's a little bit of physical, but since we're pilots, we don't, we don't weight it too heavily, you know, like we're not too worried about the fitness side of things. Um, but yeah, so there's the order of merit. And by the end of it, the, we, we got two Apaches in our class and they went one and two and the third aircraft was a Kiowa and the rest were Chinooks and Blackhawks. Wow. Wow. So it, it was no kidding. It's like everybody in a room. Hey, number one student is so-and-so. What do you want? All right. Apaches. Okay. It comes off the list. And, and it's just like that for 30 people. So it's, it's nerve wracking day of, but there's a lot of like, there's, there are personalities for aircraft. And I don't know if people outside the flight community understand that but like people who fly chinooks tend to be like the pretty laid back chill you know they don't mind sleeping with the roof over their head if if they got to hang out in the back for a while they're cool having other people watch them fly whereas in the apache like you got a a co-pilot that's it there's no crew chief watching you screw up so everybody, every airframe has its own personality. So you do have some folks who really want to get these lift aircraft. But for us, it was like the first three were attack and recon. Ryan, actually, for the people who might not be super familiar with uh, military airframes, can you give us a rundown on the choices you guys had? Yeah, so what- we, had, we had five. You're right. Yeah, so we had five different aircraft. So Apaches, right? So just two seat, two engine gunships. Then there were Kiowas, which single engine, no doors, kind of cool little reconnaissance aircraft. And then you've got Blackhawks. So that that also includes your medevac. But the classes we were in, it was just strictly like you were going to a conventional unit to fly Blackhawks, not for medevac. And then Chinooks. So you got your dual rotor, um, uh, big old lift aircraft, you know, carrying 30 guys. And then we also had one spot for a fixed wing to go and fly VIPs. And to me, it was like, why would you want to go do that? Like, if you wanted to do that, why not go to the Air Force? But there, there was one guy who got it, and it was a perfect fit for him, and, and it made a lot of sense. You could go and fly some, almost like some intel work, VIP flight. He had a great career doing that. But uh, those were our aircraft. And now there's a, they've retired, I think, the Kiowa, and they have a Lakota in there. I believe it is now. Uh- Really so, interesting. so then you get uh, actually, yeah. hey Jack, could I? Sorry, this might be interesting. At the time, so this is just after nine eleven kicked off. This is probably still the same today. One sixtieth, which you guys worked with for sure, like the cream of the crop for the aviation community. They would come around and they would pull one or two guys or girls out of well, guys at the time out of flight school, like right out of flight school into one sixty. It was rare, but you could do it. But you'd have to go fly Chinooks. I, I shouldn't say it like you have to go fly. But right. If you if you had aspirations of going and flying little bird guns, which is if you're flying guns at all, that's the only thing you'd ever want to go fly. Then you got to go and do your time in conventional units. But they were pulling a couple people every now and then out of flight school. So that was something you also had to weigh like, hey, do I want to give up this gun slot to go and fly in 160th, which would be amazing, but I'm going to be flying lift uh, for my future, basically. So right. that was one other wrinkle that they threw in at the end. Because once you get on an airframe, they kind of like keep you on it, right? Like how how does that work? Like with the little bird pilots, do they come out of like, were they former conventional Blackhawk pilots? What's that normal trajectory like? Yeah, so as you can imagine, just like in your guys' career paths, you're with these folks who end up going to the elite units just like you both did. And so you end up knowing these people. Um, so... I, I ended up with a couple guys who I knew who went into 160th and typically like the, the gun side of 160th is looking for people who had flown Apaches and, um, and Kiowas like who, who had experience pulling the trigger for the guns. Like, uh-huh. I think you could, you could be an Apache pilot and fly a little bird where you're in, infilling somebody, you know, uh-huh. um, the, the MH version, right? Yeah. Uh-huh. yeah the MH version. Um, I think they would also take Blackhawk and Chinook guys, but I think it's pretty competitive when you're trying to get into one of those gun slots that you come from a gun community Mm -hmm. beforehand. So you hit your Apache training. What was that like learning to, you know, now you're getting into like learning your dream job, right? Yeah. No, it's funny because the, 
the pressure that you put on yourself or the pressure that's put on you kind of changes when you come out of like, you're no longer competing for the slot. That's all done. And now you're just like, now it's real in terms of, I got to make myself the best pilot I can before I get to my unit. Cause I, I need to be safe. And I need to, once I hit that unit, I got to be progressing through this ladder that we have in aviation. Mm -hmm. So you can kind of stand out and, and get to the jobs you want. So as we're getting into training, it's more like I had a guy who had just come out of the war zone. Like he was in right in the evasion of Iraq. Like he had combat experience. It was great learning from him. So it was really like, how much can I soak up from this guy in this very short period of time before I get out the door? And it's actually like in, in the basic part of flight school, there are 30 students, but here there might've been a class of six. It's really small and more intimate as you're going through it. And one of the things that, you know, if you guys have heard somebody talk about flying the bag, it's kind of an interesting story. Like it only happens in the Apache community. It's how they train you to fly looking out of just one eye. Have you guys heard of this yet? No. no. So th this, I think it, you just don't hear about it unless you come out of this community, but it's a really tough part of flight school. That's kind of interesting. So in the Apache, you got this thing on the front. It's your, your FLIR, we call it the forward looking infrared. So it's all thermal sites and the only way you can see at night in the apache if you're not wearing mvgs is through your monocle so it's like this little glass eyepiece that you wear but it projects an image of thermal signatures in your eye in this tiny little optic in front of your your right eye and you have to train yourself because as you look through that monocle you're looking at something that's right here, but your other eye is looking out into the distance. Right. And so you gotta be able to look inside the cockpit with your other eye and out and look for other aircraft and obstacles and take shots at stuff. So to learn how to fly like that takes several hours for you to overcome the sickness that comes with it because it's so disorienting. So they call it the bag where they put this tarp over the cockpit so you can't see out. Um, so the dude flying behind you, you're up in the front seat of the Apache, the guy flying behind you, who's the instructor pilot, he can, I think he can see out or he's using the FLIR as well. Cause he's experienced with it. And then you have no way to look outside the cockpit. You're 100% flying with just what you can see in this little eyepiece. And it, a lot of guys end up puking going through this part of it. And okay. it's super disorienting and it's one of the other ego crushing parts of flight school that you go through on the Apache track. Yeah. So what's that like having an instructor in like behind you? I, I mean, you is it, today? And, and I don't like, I don't even know an Apache does, does like your, your co-pilot can't, do they have control? Can they take control uh, in a normal Apache? And then it, with an instructor, do they have like, like a driving instructor, like the brakes and stuff like that? Yeah, so the the Apache that we use in flight school is the same one that we use in the regular Army. Okay. And so you can do everything from both seats. Okay. So you could fire, technically you could fire a Hellfire missile from the back seat, although it's super rare because of the way you do it, but you could. Um, so they have all the controls necessary for when you inevitably screw up that they can control it and, and bring you back down to the ground safely. But a couple of the things with it, we like to joke with Blackhawks and Chinooks and Kiowas that we sit you know, front to back so that you can't hold hands with the other pilot. Like, <laughs> so you wouldn't, you wouldn't like fly with us because you can't hold the hand of your co-pilot, you know? So we'll give them, we'll, we'll haze them a little bit with that. But there is a, there's a, like a, a glass shield between you. And the only reason I bring that up between the two pilots front to back is in the Cobras, they didn't have that. So almost every guy I ever talked to who flew Cobras would say, the, the instructor pilot in the backseat would like dump their ashtray on you in the front if you screwed up or they do something to yell at you through there. And you couldn't do that in the Apache because you had a blast shield in between the two cockpits. That's fascinating. What what did your dad, I, did your dad fly Cobra? I, I forgot what your dad flew, but- Just Huey's, he Huey's. flew Huey Slick. So no armament, you and know, no guns. What did he think of you like flying an Apache? Did he- I think he, you know, I think he found it pretty cool that I was going down this path. And when I was in flight school, I went to one of his reunions. He he goes to a reunion every year with these pilots that he was with in Vietnam. It's awesome. And they were all telling stories about how he used to fly and some of the ops they were on. So I think it to him, 
he didn't really care what I was flying. You know, that didn't really matter to him. He just, I think he thought it was interesting that we both flew. And it truly wasn't until I came back from Afghanistan that we had some no shit discussions on. Like, it, it was kind of like my baptism by fire. And then we started talking real about some of these events. That's amazing. So how, and how long was the Apache training? It's probably four to five months probably four months, four to five months, I would say. Once once you come out of basic, yeah, you go through that Apache pipeline. And actually, I, I went through, I flew, the, we call it the alpha model. So it's like the older model Apache that they used early Gulf War, not early Gulf, early in Iraq and Afghanistan. And they had just transitioned to this thing called the Delta model at the time. So I did the, the alpha and then had to do the secondary course for the Delta, which sucked because it kept me there longer. But this thing gave us a whole host of different capabilities. But one critical one was the optics were way better. So we could see bad guys miles out now where before they could hear us, which was not the case uh, years earlier. So that was a huge advantage by the time we got to Afghanistan. Hey, can you give us a brief rundown on the armament that the AH-64 can carry? Because it is pretty impressive, the amount of uh, hate. Yeah, yeah it's, that can it's bring awesome. Down. Yeah, it brings some hate, man. Yeah. So, so this on the small end, it's got 30 mil rounds, which are like, you know, six or seven inches long. They're the bullets. They're like the small armament you carry. And you usually have about 300 of those. And you got this cannon that sits down just below where the front seater sits that, that is running these things through. And I mean, when that thing fires, you can kind of feel it underneath your butt as you're flying. It's a cool sound and you kind of smell it. It's awesome. And then it's also got these 2.75 inch uh, rockets, right? So I think I've heard you guys talk about them before, like coming from an A-10, which is pretty badass. Um, but they have a different sets of warheads on them. We would carry uh, like some white phosphorus, some, some more explosive type rounds with those rockets. And we usually carried, we carry about a pod of... God, I'm sure an instructor pilot's going to hit me somewhere, but probably like 12 of those we'd have on board. But because of weight, we just couldn't carry that much. Mm -hmm. And then we'd have two to three Hellfire missiles, which are like five foot tall, badass missiles that have their own internal computer system. Um, so this is kind of like fire and forget. So you're lazing a target, you fire it, that thing is going in, it's going to hit that target. Um, and you had different warheads that could go on that as well for you know, thermobaric and high explosive type, uh, type work. And we carried maybe two of those three on a good day in Afghanistan. Yeah. And did they have to, I mean, I assume that there were people who figured out all the, because of the temperature and the altitude in Afghanistan, where you were going, you know, the lift capability of helicopters did, did, so would every time you loaded out for a mission, did it have to be a different loadout based on all those environmental factors? Pretty much. Yes. I mean, the, as you guys know very well, the difference in temperature in those places, whether it's Iraq or Afghanistan, you know, can be significant. So, you know, we might be able to squeeze in a few more of those, but for the most part, it was a fairly consistent load. And we had some extended fuel tanks, you know, just so we could spend a little more time up in the air. But yeah, for the most part, it was a consistent load set based on in Afghanistan, not just the heat, but the altitude, right. which sucks it out of these aircraft. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Ryan, but uh, I mean, the Apache is designed to be like a tank killer, right? That was the initial conception behind it. Can you talk yeah. to us a little bit about what the Apache was designed for versus what it ended up being used for during, you know, your deployments? Yeah. And actually this, like th this brings up just a, hu a very important uh, memory for me. So we were truly, when I was in flight school, and we went out and did our gunnery. So we go out to the range and actually shoot for the first time. We did it like we were Cold War Apaches, which mm -hmm. is how they were designed. Exactly like you said, Jack, going out. Like you should go out as a battalion with 18 to 24 Apaches at the same time on a line behind a tree line. Everybody at the same time pops up, but just enough so you could get like your radar above the tree line. Scan 90 Russian tanks. And all of you fire missiles because you pretty much only have 16 missiles at these tanks and hit them all at the same time without ever exposing yourself. Oh, so you're shit. at a hover, pulling up, <laughs> not exposing yourself, firing and leaving 
that that was the plan behind it. So early in Iraq in 2003, there's a significant date, uh, March 23rd, 2003 in, in Iraq, when the Apache community was supposed to have this, like it's got all this new armament on it. It goes out, it goes to a hover and it hover, like this battalion goes out. Some of them crash on takeoff because they brown out. They're not used to the, the uh, weight restrictions. And so some of them don't make it out. They get online. They're hovering right above enemy positions. They're getting shot up. They limp back to base. It's kind of like a black eye for the Apache community early on in the war, which is not good. So they immediately start changing the tactics to what, what everybody has seen in Vietnam from Cobras, basically like uh -huh. moving while you shoot. Uh -huh. But it's not normal. It's not how everybody has been trained for the past 15 to 20 years in this airframe. So they didn't even train us on that in 2004 as I was coming out of the pipeline. When I went to Germany, which was my first duty assignment, our second gunnery run, we started doing these tactics. So we're shooting on the run and it sounds easy. And after you get the hang of it, like it's easier. But when you're in like a 10 to 20 degree dive, yeah. 10 degrees doesn't sound like a lot. It's significant. Like you're pulling G's. It's, it's a totally different experience than like pulling up to a hover when you're really low, popping up and shooting. So we would do these gunnery exercises out in at Grafenvir for those like tons of people here. But I'm, I'm sure you guys yeah. probably spent time there. One of the other training centers. And um, anyway, like we're out there, we're shooting. And actually it was the first time I had done gunnery as a pilot in command. So you get to a unit, you're a nobody, you work your way up to when somebody says, okay, you're safe enough to put another human's life in your hands. You're a pilot in command. So I was a, a PC, we call it for this, this round of gunnery and it's day and night shooting. And we went out at night and I mean, it was like white knuckle flying for me. Just I'm flying at night, you know, FLIR, this other human's life is in my hands. We're firing down range. Like we just don't fire a lot. So we went through and did fine on our gunnery runs. But one of the nights, one of the air crews, a C so a, a CW3, a senior warrant officer, and then a W2, a guy who had just made W2, both former Rangers, um, who had transitioned over to be pilots, which is not uncommon. Mm -hmm. They went in on a gun run, got fixated on a target and, and weren't able to pull up and flew straight into the ground. Oh my God. And so like just disintegrated, there's just nothing left after that type of crash. It's really bad. So that was, you know, I was a junior Lieutenant at the time and it was like a rude awakening of what can happen if you, if you don't appreciate how dangerous flying is. And they they were good pilots, and they just got fixated on targets. Yeah, flew straight into the ground. Jeez. Now, when when you're doing that type of the run, are you actually? Because I know you know helicopter can move in different in several directions. Are you actually like a plane diving towards your target, or are you angled and still moving forward? Yeah, you're diving down towards it, like like a plane analogy, as you would have said. And you do that for several reasons. One is like. I mean, you get up to altitude and you come in quick, but you kind all of your rotor wash that's coming down is going behind you. So it's not this, you know, it's not distorting or disrupting the, the munitions as they're coming off the aircraft. And it just gives you a better alignment with the wind as you're trying to take shots. So it, it serves several purposes, but it's necessary. So you yeah. got to come in pretty hot and, and target fixation is no joke. Yeah. Like every pilot's had to deal with it. Yeah, Ryan, I want to ask you about, you know, getting deployed overseas and, you know, not missing the war, as it turns out. Uh, I want to give uh, a quick shout out to our sponsors, though. Uh, Dave, you got that watch? There you go. That so, is a Par Weber watch. They are a uh, sponsor for the show. And if you check out their uh, website, uh, you can take a look at these watches. They have a, uh, a proprietary illumination system. It's uh, probably the best on the market. It's always on. It lasts for years, three to four years. It never needs a fresh battery. Or, I'm sorry, three to four years before it needs a fresh battery. Uh, they're based in Chicago, an American-made watch, and uh, they are assembled in Switzerland. And if you guys go uh, to their website and you want to check out these watches, there is a promo code. Uh, is it Team House? We actually have our own uh, our own 
what's it, our own URL? It's parweber.com slash team house. One word. Yeah, it's P A R W E B E R dot com. Was was watching kind or was 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 uh were watches kind of a a thing amongst AD, aviators? Less so for us, more so at the agency. <laughs> Okay, we'll get to, we'll get yeah, to that. Because they, their watches are like you can generally tell in a, a you know a spec ops guy like in Vegas or whatever. Big based, Sunto. It, you know the the bearded guy with tats <laughs> at a table with the big ass watch. That's right. It was usually somebody at home on leave who decided to go uh, go mix it up. But this these are nice watches. They're not. It's a nice hefty it's, watch. It's, it's he- heavy. Really nice watch. And if you guys go there uh, through December thirty first, you can get a free strap with your purchase of their watch, the coefficient. Just go to parweber.com slash team house to activate the offer. Yeah. And then our second uh, sponsor we want to tell you guys about is everyone's favorite, Manscaped. So for those of you who are interested in male grooming, Manscaped is really the place that you want to go. How's it going, Dave? You like that? Male grooming. Uh, they make a, uh, a, a, what is it? The lawnmower 4.0 is the actual hair trimmer they have. A little LED light on there so you can get some of those uh, crevices and hard to reach places. They make, uh, there's a body wash and a shampoo now. They have a ear and nose trimmer. There's all sorts of different male grooming products that they have. They have a ball deodorant. I mean, there's a tonic. Right now. How nice, like when you were flying and you're sitting in those seats and, and I'm sure that it gets hot. How it nice, gets sweaty. Yeah. How nice would it have had been to have a ball deodorant back when you were deploying? They probably have that if you're a naval aviator, I'm guessing. Yeah. I mean, day five of the field problem, you can smell your own balls. It's bad. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's pretty bad. Um, so, so and, a, and a nice tonic for that aftershave freshness, that zing to wake you up. Yeah. There's a whole kit you guys can go get uh, for all of your male grooming needs. So if you go there and you use the promo code TEAM20, you'll get 20% off your purchase. So go check them out, guys. And free shipping. And free shipping. Manscaped.com. All right, back to Ryan. Back to our regularly scheduled programming here. Uh, Tell us about your uh, your first time getting deployed overseas, Ryan. Where were you going? What was the mission? Yeah, so I, I was in Germany as my first assignment, and the unit I got to had just redeployed from Iraq. So I was sitting there doing nothing, and desperately wanted to go down range and it just wasn't our unit just didn't get tapped so i went back to our career course um so instead of going to the aviation one i went to the infantry one so that that was actually interesting seeing what guys like you do at benning as you're running around on on a regular morning because it sure as hell is not what pilots are doing at that time of day right we're not doing combatives by any means so anyway, I went through that, but it was great because I got to meet a lot of guys who ended up being uh, company commanders on the ground in Afghanistan when I was overhead flying. And it was awesome to know just to to know them personally, but to understand how they're thinking through, you know, breaching a target or or their scheme of maneuver on the ground. So right. I found that really valuable. I went to Campbell and then we deployed to Afghanistan in just at the end of 2007. So I was there throughout 2008. Right. I just out of curiosity, how does that work? Because you would think as a helicopter officer that you would go to a helicopter uh, career course or whatever. Like, what's the difference and why yeah. did you get to go to the infantry career course? So they, they keep a couple slots at all of these career courses for other branches. So I like if there's anybody listening who's going that direction, I would highly recommend jumping out of your current branch to go try something else. Um, for the career course, just to learn from other folks. Now, at the aviation career course, it's notorious for doing Frisbee golf. Like that is the exercise of choice there and ultimate Frisbee. And that sure as hell was not what we were doing at Benning. Like there was a whole (laughs) set of guys who were going to SF and they were going to be team leaders. I was put with all the tankers and heavy mech guys because I was an Apache guy. So we played, we did, we played the SF dudes in ultimate Frisbee one day and got annihilated. (laughs) Like it's not even fair to put these guys with a bunch of tankers and heavy mech and pilots. But it, anyway, no. So it was really good. There were only a couple slots, and there were Marines there. A Marine was the number one dude coming out of the the Army Infantry Career Course, which I thought was amazing. But anyway, so it was good cross pollination, and you know, you just completely learned how they thought and operated. Yeah. Did uh, do you think that having gone to that it, it- it helped you when you did have your first combat tour? 
hundred percent. Yeah. I, I thought it was huge. I, I mean, truly, like I was on the radio one time and a guy goes, Hey, is that Fugit? Is that you? And I was like, Yeah, that's me, man. And he's, you know, he told me who he was. And so we just had that connection. Yeah. Or guys who I knew when they were in contact, like it, it meant a lot to me to get overhead if there was a dude on the ground on you. Not like I wouldn't try if there was someone else, but right. you know, there's this personal connection that you have. But also, like there was like the worst event that we had, and we can get to this later, but it was it was more of like a deliberate operation into a valley. And when we were doing the briefings and everything, I was a company commander, so we were kind of going through the briefing. And as the, as the ground battalion commander is briefing, I understood everything he was talking about. It all made sense why you want to put positions like we got a block here we have to move here we're you know all of that made sense to me at that point in time and it never would have from an aviation perspective yeah well let's uh, let's start talking about that some uh, any significant operations that you were involved in overseas as an apache pilot yeah you're, you're how about your first combat your first encounter yeah so Jack, I think when you and I were talking, you may have brought up one that I was in because I was at Salerno and you, I think you asked me, you were like, hey, were you there when the base got attacked? So anyway, so we could talk about that. That wasn't my first one, but my first one, and I ask everybody this as well, like, what was your first time going outside the wire? And some people it's crazy, you know, violent. For me, it was not. I was just out on a day flight, um, daytime flight going out to ship and there, there was some contact on the ground, but it was kind of in this area that had a bunch of compounds um, with pretty dense foliage inside compound walls. So the enemy had moved into that position like where we couldn't really see them. And there was a ground unit moving on them. And so we covered them for a while before we had to break station and it just wasn't that kinetic. So we left. But I will say like that first time outside the wire, I thought, you know, in my mind, I'm thinking I'm going into like World War II here because that's just that's my my feeling at the time was thinking like, oh, my God, what's going to happen? We're going to be shooting off all of our rounds. We're going Winchester here in a minute. And it wasn't <laughs> yeah. Like that at all. yeah. And Winchester, for those of you who don't know, is just going dry on ammo. And I will just take a, a, a second to mention in the intro, the team house intro, there's a clip in there of an Apache doing a gun run. That's actually something I filmed in Iraq. Of uh, Apaches nice. coming in and doing and doing gun runs to support a, a ranger operation in uh, outside Mosul. That's awesome. No, and to your point, so as as I just kind of alluded to, so I was at Salerno, and there was Chapman nearby, which everybody knows from the, unfortunately 2009 big attack there on some CIA folks, but they they weren't too far apart. But in in July of 2008, when I was at Salerno, I was on our QRF, so our quick reaction force. So we had two aircraft at all times that were ready to launch and go help people throughout like five provinces. And we, like pilots, so we're on a night cycle. So we wake up late at night. We go to the chow hall to eat midnight chow. And it's four dudes sitting there. We're all eating way too much food. And then we get a call on the radio like, hey, base is getting attacked. Everybody, you know, get to get to the aircraft. You do not want to see four pilots run, period, but certainly not after eating like <laughs> eggs and bacon and all this stuff. So so we get in some gators, you know, we're driving they're driving us out closer to the airfield before we start our our like 200 meter sprint. You know, if we even made it in without having to stop. But this was the first time I had been this close to fire like this. So like Salerno is a pretty big base, you know, comparatively, certainly from where you've been, I'm sure Jack out in the middle of nowhere, say, and, and you, David. Um, so it's got a pretty big perimeter, tons of air, not tons, a lot of aircraft there. So as we're running out to the flight line, like we could, we could hear rounds coming in like mortar rounds. We could see tracer fire. And when you launch in an Apache, you have a crew chief who sits on the wing with you or who's outside the aircraft connected with a mic. So it's the two pilot, co-pilot, and then you've got your crew chief who owns the aircraft, basically. And they're checking you off as you're, as you're ramping up. And, and it was the most intense I'd seen. Like, I'd never had people shooting at me like this when I was outside of an aircraft, just getting in. So we're, we're getting into the aircraft. Rounds are coming in. Our crew chiefs are still on the line. And I'm the... I'm the company commander at the time. And I'm telling these guys, I'm like, 
guys, disconnect and get in. We'll be all right. We can take off on our own. And they stayed with us, which I just thought was badass. I loved seeing it. Like crew chiefs in the Apache side of the world, they don't get to fly with you. Like there's no room for them to fly. Right. So they're, they're kind of confined to the base. And this night in particular, I just saw some serious bravery from these guys. I loved seeing it. And there are unsung heroes in this community. But we finally took off and it was insane. So the base that we, at Salerno at the time was kind of owned by an artillery unit, right? Well, so when, not when was infantry this? guys. Oh, wait, 2008. Okay. So July of 2008. And at, what set all this off was a V-bid that hit our front gate and then like a basically a coordinated attack on the base, uh-huh. which had, had really not happened that often. It was rare for that to happen. So we took off and artillery folks are manning the perimeter, but they're not, you know, they're not infantrymen. Uh-huh. So they're not used to like moving outside and closing with the enemy the same way an infantry unit is. And so when we got in the air, we're trying to get situational awareness on the ground. And it was m- mayhem. Just so we're, we got night vision, usually in the Apache, one guy will be flying FLIR, so uh-huh. the, the thermal, and one guy will be up on night vision goggles, depending on what the moon and illumination is. And we're just initially, like usually we take off and we fly for 15 minutes at least, sometimes an hour before we're in contact. And here it's immediate. Uh-huh. And the radios are blowing up. You got different units trying to like defend different parts of the base. And you got folks trying to move when they're not tactically used to doing that and then we got chapman fob chapman nearby which has all these kick-ass operators there and they're coming out to play also because they're like oh shit there's a fight and it's here we're coming out so we spent at least 20 or 30 minutes just trying to figure out who the good guys were and who the bad guys were right and one of the things we do when we're on a tight target like this is so the Apache is, is one of the most advanced aircraft you have. So you've got different displays up in the cockpit, different screens. And so what we'll do is we'll drop these different boxes on the screen and, and basically text them to the other aircraft. So it shows up on their screen. Oh, cool. And, and we'll, we'll, sh- we'll basically drop a line that says, hey, don't cross this line. Like you guys stay north of this. We'll stay south. And then we can kind of focus on what's going on around us without having to stay in a formation, right? Like, which we'll do in other, in other scenarios. But in this case, it was like, let's drop a line. You stay over there. We'll be over here. And we got lined up to take a shot. So I'm in the front seat, which is where you do most of the shooting from. And you've got this system with these like handles, joysticks, basically, to do all your shooting. And my backseater, who's the most experienced dude in the unit, is flying us around and actually sorry no no no. so this is i was in the back seat he was in the front seat so the most experienced guy was in the front seat and i was in the back seat because we thought like hey we're on qrf it's unlikely we'll launch but we're getting complacent here so let's switch up seats so i was in the back where i'm flying mostly where as the company commander i'm usually the guy directing the fight i shouldn't be flying i should be taking shots and coordinating so I'm in the back, we're flying around. I clear him for a shot. And like a second before, I, I'm like, you're clear. And just as I say that, our wingman flies right in front of us. So like if he had pulled the trigger, we potentially could have shot down our wingman. Like it, it was one of the worst experiences of my life. So I am like, I'm shook at that point. For yeah. Like 10 seconds. Yeah. So I pull out and, and I just start coasting for a little bit to re to regain. And this guy, JT, I interviewed him. He was the, the dude in the front seat. He was the second interview I ever did. And we talked about this on air. And he, like the amount of poise he showed in not tearing my ass apart. And he's a warrant officer, right? So he's a CW4. So technically I, I outrank him but not in reality. Right. Like it, the hierarchy there is he's an incredible pilot and I'm a newbie basically. And he's like, Hey, are you good, sir? Are you ready to go? And you know, we took like maybe 10 seconds. And I was like, yeah, let's get back in. And we got back in and we, and, and so we ended up helping here. We took some shots. I, I don't think we actually, I doubt we would have killed anybody there. Like it was a really chaotic scene, but we got back in and helped kind of like calm calm the situation down, landed. Um, but I, I still remember that as like, we did what we were supposed to do, 
but man, like it was, it was another ego check for me that, uh, that you just can't be, you got to be on the details of everything. And I couldn't be trying to run the battle from the back seat. And I was really appreciative of how he handled that situation with me. It could have been worse. What was that a result of, uh, your, your wingman breaking in that line or it was, that was, that was me losing situational awareness. Yeah. You know, and, and Jack, I think back to the, you telling me that story about the first time you pulled the trigger yeah. and almost having a friendly fire and, you know, like owning up to it. Like, I don't want to tell this story. It makes me sound like I don't know what I'm doing. Right. You know, but it's chaotic in it, combat. Yeah. So people who want to know what it's like, it is chaotic, man. Right. Especially you got all these radios blowing up. We got air to air. We're talking to our talk. We're talking to the artillery talk. We got new guys coming in from spooky land from Chapman who are all parts of different organizations <laughs> we're not allowed to know about. We got artillery men trying to move like infantry units. And then we're just trying to deconflict. So it, it just gets crazy, but yeah. it's reality out there. Yeah. yeah. I, I think, you know, for people who have been in combat, they understand what the fog of war actually is. Um, I think that if you haven't been in that situation, like it's conceptual, like, oh, things can confuse a bit. You're making split second decisions that might cost you your life or somebody else's life. And, you know, and it's easy to get target fixated. It's easy to you know, make the wrong call yeah. or it, it's just easy. Yeah. And you know? as, as Ryan points out, I mean, when we tell these kind of like war stories and deployment stories, we have a tendency to talk about the ones where things went really good and we feel really good about, but we all wish that the way it worked was you go in and it's nice clean headshots on some Al Qaeda terrorists and the bad guys die and the good guys get home to the fob in time for hot sandwiches and soup. But the reality is it often doesn't work out that way. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, no, I, I absolutely agree that, you know, it's important to tell some of these stories. Yeah. And, and so it's interesting. So generally you said that the more senior person generally or the more experienced person generally sits in the back. And are there are they responsible for flying? Are they can they are they elevated where they can see out the cockpit as well as the person in front? Yeah. Yeah, so they're elevated. So they're sitting behind and up from the guy in the front seat. So they can see everything and they're in a better position to fly. In the front seat, you're kind of down like just behind this, uh, your panel, your instrument panel. It's got all everything on it. So you can kind of see out, but it's not as, it's not as natural. So the natural place to fly is the back seat. And the front has a set of systems on it that are designed for target acquisition and firing that it does not... It's not available in the back seat. So you want to put the pilot in command in the back responsible for just flying and making sure the flight is safe and the person coordinating and shooting is up front. That's really interesting. I, it reminds me of a, uh, like a sniper team because most, like the most people think that the most experienced person is the one shooting, but that's not the case. The spotter really? is, yeah, the spotter is the most experienced one because they be, need to be able to, read the winds, read trace, you know, like they're the ones dialing the person in because anybody can be trained to pull a trigger. Um, but all the mechanics of it actually fall on the spotter generally. So mm. were there any, any other like significant operations, that, noteworthy operations, good or bad that you think are, are worth uh, discussing? Yeah, I, I do. So there's one that comes to mind. And for me, like this was, the craziest op I was ever on. And when I interviewed this same guy who was in this flight with me in this senior warrant, I interviewed him and I asked him, you know, so he had, I think 4,000 flight hours. He did four deployments. And I said, what was the, the worst day you ever had? And it was this day. So it was a, a daytime flight. We infilled. So it was in Wardak province. So near Ghazni, for, you know, like, I don't know if you guys ever spent time there. It was in this valley called the Jalrez Valley. And my aviation battalion commander was West Point classmates with the infantry ground space commander, right? So the battalion commander on the ground. And so they were paired up pretty tightly and he wanted to support him all the time. So this guy on the ground wanted to go in and go into this area and pick a fight. And every time we went into this area, we picked a, like somebody got shot in this place. Anytime we ever flew in there, someone was getting shot. So they infilled a company in on the ground and kept them there for a week. And then they came, the idea was they'd 
pick a fight, find out where the bad guys were, and then come back out. So they, after this, so this was 2008, like I think in nine or 10, they ended up putting a fob in this valley. But at, the, at that time, there was nothing. Like it was the end of the world as far as we were concerned. So we infilled this infantry company one week, completely quiet infill, nothing going on. We drop them off, we, uh, like Chinooks, they ground infill, they drove in half the unit, half of them we infilled by air. Nothing happened for a week. And then we went to X film and we just knew this was going to be bad. And I went with this guy to our battalion commander and I was like, hey, if there's a way we can change up how we're doing this, like we think we need to. We think somebody's going to get killed here. Like we just what we know about this area is bad. We shouldn't be going in here, but we went in anyway. And so I stacked the teams for this base, this one mission with like who I thought was the best in our unit. So. We had multi ships, but we had two Apaches going in with two Chinooks, and and then we would rotate because it was going to take hours. It was it was probably an hour and a half flight just to get there from our base and get them back home, and then we'd have to refuel. It was going to take all day. So we stacked the teams. We fly in, and as we're flying in, we started getting so it's two Chinooks and then two Apaches behind them, and we started getting airburst RPGs coming up, broad daylight. And it's probably probably like three or four thousand foot mountains in a pretty narrow valley with a single road in and out. Like there was no and and maybe like three hundred meters of terrain on either side of the road, right? So it's single road, high steep valley, like steep uh, steep mountains, and we're flying in and we're already taking air bursts. The, the Chinooks are able to exfil folks. So we exfil with them and then we come back to cover the ground convoy. And there's been no contact on the ground, just us getting shot at as we fly in. And then as the ground convoy is exfilling, we're overhead. And again, like it was a clear blue day. And we're talking with the ground convoy. Everything's good. They come up to this like area that has an overpass and they get ambushed. Mm -hmm. And so it's starting out here. Like we're scanning the hell out of this area. And one of the dudes who's on the other front seater, so I'm in the front seat, and our other front seater is a guy who has gone on to be a little bird gun pilot, like flight lead in 160th, so an incredibly gifted pilot. He used to find people when no one else could see them, and he couldn't find anybody. And so already we're on the back foot. It's a no-shit ambush. The, they initiated it by hitting a dude in one of the Humvees, like directly with an RPG. So dude took it in the chest in oh an RPG. God. So it's immediate chaos. Like we got to, we got to call in a medevac, got to get out of these guys out of the kill zone. And we could not see any enemy guys on the ground. No one, like we just could not see them. And so we're flying around overhead for a couple minutes and it's insane on the radios. Like, I don't know if you guys were ever in this scenario, but there were a few times where I heard guys on the ground, like screaming into the radios. Cause it, it's no shit life or death at this moment. You know, it's not, we're observing this, like we're taking fire. We've got to get out of the kill zone, put some lead down here. So we're incredibly frustrated in the air. We just can't see anyone and we don't want to pull the trigger and hit one of our own guys. It's truly danger close. So at one point, the uh, the same guy, JT, says to us, we're, commute, we're talking air to air. And he says, hey, guys, we can't, we can't get a shot off. Let's fly down low and see if they'll shoot at us instead of these guys and get them out of the kill zone. So he's like, I want to make sure you guys are OK doing it because we might get killed. And so we said, yep, let's go ahead and do it. So we come in and we, we did a couple passes low and we were coming in low on one of them. And we could feel our aircraft like bump up a couple feet, which is rare. And it was small arms fire hitting us. And then we saw an RPG fly out our left window like, I don't know if it was 10 meters, but we just we, me and my backseater were joking afterwards. It looked like an Acme rocket. It was so slow, like it was Wiley e. Coyote or something, like just cruising by us. And if it had air burst, I don't know what would have happened. But this guy had a beat on us and just missed us. So, like, for me, that was probably the closest I came to dying. And it was, you know, to me, it was nerve wracking. So we got back up, we're flying, and in the Apache, when you're sitting on the controls in the front seat, it's designed to be like a long range shot. So you're shooting missiles and rockets uh -huh. usually from the front seat and you can shoot the gun. 
but usually you have like more freedom to maneuver and and space to shoot but we were real tight on this one because of the terrain so the guy in the back seat ended up taking the gun and in the apache like wherever you're looking with the monocle you can pull the trigger and shoot 30 mil so he started putting rounds down just looking at targets and pulling pulling the trigger which was rare like daytime like shots from the back seat kind of in that in that scenario are rare from what we had seen so we were just trying to put some rounds down and we ended up getting some hits and getting these guys out of the kill zone. But this ended up being a 10 hour day for us. Like we needed a general order approval, a general officer's approval to continue flying because we had to go back in so many times to get these guys out. Medevac came in, they got shot up on the way out. Um, and then just making sure like everybody was safe back at their base before we landed. So at the end of the day, we landed back in coast in Salerno and I hopped out of the aircraft. We turn it off. Me, me and the co-pilot, we jump out. And as soon as the pressure leaves the aircraft, like there's not all this stuff circulating, like the fluid can settle and it just started pouring out of bullet holes that we, we had shit. all over the airframe. And then wow. the crew chiefs, they're like, God damn it, sir. Like I got to, you know, they, it's the, they're glad you came back. Like right. it's all good, good natured fun, but they're like, God, you got my aircraft shot up. What the hell? But they would go and they pulled out, they pulled out rounds and they pulled out one from our fuel cell. And this was pretty damn cool. So like, I still have this, this, uh, AK round that we got hit with in our fuel cell, in our fuel bladder. So the bladder was designed so that it would seal, it would self seal as a round came in so that you didn't get any air into the fuel system to combust. And I never believed it would work. And that shit worked wow. when we needed it. That's you know? amazing. So it was awesome. And we got a bunch of pictures of like where the rounds came in and we got to keep some of them. But to me, like that was a huge deal. Personally, that was the, the worst I'd ever been in. Why, uh, why did you guys need a general officer's approval uh, to, was it because of the length of the operation or? It's flight time. So I'm sure you guys have both been in situations it's... where you've had aircraft and been like, uh, we got crew rest. We got to go. It's, it's an unfortunate part of flying i think yeah we had basically uh, when, when clay yeah, Huttmacher, when clay Huttmacher was on he talked about it was he was the 160th commander and at yep. a certain point the the pilots would get to a certain point and he'd have to either ground them or bless off on extending the amount of time they can fly and he's like yeah sometimes i extended it and then if the pilot you know his rear rotor clips the side of the hangar it's like well that's my fault i shouldn't have authorized that exactly <laughs> And so it, it goes up the, the chain of command. So if you're flying daytime, you can fly for like eight hours, I think. If you're flying night vision, it's six. If you're flying just FLIR, I think it was like four or five because it just, it, it's, it's, it mentally drains you from right. having to be on the ball like that. And look, man, I mean, talking to ground guys, you're going through much worse, but they're just so worried about a catastrophic incident with right, an aircraft right. that they don't want to mess with it. So as you start like breaking those thresholds you kind of have to go to your battalion commander then to the brigade and then eventually it gets up to like general officer level where they have to say all right keep them flying because they're in some serious shit yeah what did you guys have a problem uh, uh was it situational whether you could fly daytime office because i know that was a huge issue with the air force trying to get them to fly daytime operations i think for us no. So we, we would fly daytime. We do convoy escort. We'd be QRF. I, I don't know why that is with the, with the air force. I mean, certainly, uh, see, you know, AC one thirties, I know are only going at night and obviously one sixtieth is operating at night. I feel like every time I've talked to a one sixtieth guy who got shot down, it was in the daytime. Yeah. So I see why they go at night, but no, for us, we were going daytime and I will say at night and you guys know this in Afghanistan, like you can operate with MVGs a lot, but because of the terrain, if the moon isn't very bright or it's behind some of those mountains, MVGs don't do a whole lot right. because you got to be able to see. So if you have FLIR, you can get out there and fly at night. It doesn't matter what the Illum is. So Apaches could go out and operate at night when a lot of others couldn't. Really, it was us and um, medevac birds, like CSAR birds from the Air Force that always had FLIR. So we were usually out on moonless nights. But were there any other uh, deployments as an Apache pilot or the Army um, before you started getting a, a bug in you about 
transitioning to other governmental agencies? No, no, that was it. So I did one deployment. I can't even believe it because it was almost eight years post 9-11 and just the luck of the draw. That's where I was. And I, yeah, I will say I regret that to this day that I didn't do more. It, you said that some of your viewers had asked you about like the whole uh, uh, close support, like what, what it was like on your side versus like what it was like on our side. Yeah. Can you, can you tell us what it was like? What was that feeling? Man. Yeah. That's, that's a great way to put it. So yeah, a lot of, a lot of people who listen to combat story have asked, Hey, could you talk to somebody who's been on the ground when there's an Apache up overhead? Not like talking to the Apache, but just like what it's like. And you could talk about kind of what it's the feeling is for you and the aircraft and them on the ground. So for us, like the whole reason we exist is to support you guys hundred percent, which is why I went to that infantry course. Like I just wanted to know how you operated, what your weapons could do, how to be better partners when we're up in the air. Like, it sounds corny, but like you guys were our customers. How do we make your life easier and getting your work done and keeping you safe? So for us, it was very, it was very much this idea of we're there to keep you guys alive. And if you need us, we will be there. And that's why we love A-10 pilots too. Like we felt like those were our, our cousins or something, the type of work they used to do with y'all. But, you know, I'd be curious what it was like for you guys on the ground seeing an apache yeah as i was we were talking a little bit before we started the show i got to call in gun runs from cobras in training um but in combat there was somebody much more qualified than i was doing that um we had uh in iraq we definitely had apaches doing gun runs for us uh doing support and i mean it's awesome to see them come in and, and start you know uh a lot of times reducing targets that we had actually hit as infantrymen and then just because it was kind of a scorched earth campaign against AQI at that point in 2005. So it wasn't uncommon to have like AC-130 or Apaches come in and just destroy the target after we raided it and got everyone out of there. Um, but yeah, it's a, it's a good feeling when to know those guys are overhead. I, it, we had, uh, I don't know if you had an opportunity, but we had uh, Luis Fernandez on uh, who was 80, 82nd, 82nd, right? And he talked about, uh, when he was on, you know, he could like, they could hear the guys talking, you know, they were that close, the bad guys and called, you know, and I believe it was an Apache that came in and he's talking about, you know, he can't hear the Apache and the Apache's like, no, we're right out. You know, and when you guys are flying nap of the earth and, and masking the sound and then that feeling of the Apache and my heart was like racing because like close air support, having those guys come in, especially when, Especially when you're like looking at your buddies, like, well, we're gonna we're gonna go to the last round, but like this feels like it. And having close air support come in, uh, it, it's like a spiritual experience. I mean, it, it's it's like on a really cold, cold night. You know, you've been, and then the sun, you know, Bob, the big orange ball comes up over the horizon, and starts warming you. That's exactly what it's like when when you guys show up on station when it's like when it's down to the wire and you know, and your, your optics, your ability to see people, your ability to engage it. it um, I, like I said, it, I can't describe it as anything other than a spiritual experience to, yeah. to like be pulled out of that by these guys that just roll in and you guys are always so calm, cool, collected on, on the, on the radio, you know, yeah. no matter what's what we going, sound like when we key the mic for you guys. Yeah. yeah. No, no matter what's going on. It's like, yeah, we got this. D it's like, Dave oh, and I fuck. have had the, the conversation too, which I think most like ground guys have had it uh, or have experienced when suddenly you're on target in a place like Afghanistan. And suddenly you hear like a woman's voice come over the net and everyone starts looking around the target. Like who the hell, there's a girl out here. Oh. Yeah, right. and, and then you find out later, Oh, she's in the air. Like I remember we had a, uh, I think it was a female AC one thirty pilot actually. And once in a while you'd hear her come over the net and everyone's like, well, she sounds cute. Where is she? Awesome. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's uh, it's sort of like in Lord of the Rings when, uh, <laughs> when, when they're, I don't even remember the battle, but when they're coming out of the castle and then get off in the, what with the, the cavalry's up on the mountain and they come down. It's like, Oh my God, thank God. Thanks. So, God. Uh, so Ryan, <laughs> when does uh, when does this idea come into your mind? Like, okay, I'm a pretty uh, badass Apache uh, company commander here, but I think I want to go and try something different and serve my country in a different way. What what was that sort of like progression like for you? So for me, it was early on in life. I, I really wanted to be 
you know, I followed my dad's footsteps very closely, as you could see, like I went into combat. And actually, the day that I was just talking about that nasty operation was the same day of the year where my dad got his silver star and nearly oh, wow. died. So it's really weird, like 50 years apart, um, 40 years apart, 40 years apart. Anyway, so that meant a lot to me. But growing up, I love living in these different places. I liked the idea of these embassies and this lifestyle, but I really thought that the CIA side of it was cool. I just always thought that there was something neat and interesting about it. But when, when I got out of the military, it was really like, I'm making a clean break. I had gotten an MBA. I was like, I'm going to go and do something normal, make some money. And probably three months in, I hated my life. I hated it. So any anybody who has been in the military and has come out and had to try to fill this void knows what I'm talking about. But I just, I was still young. You know, I felt young and I wanted to do more. And I threw everything I had at getting in to the agency. So I applied, it takes a long time to get in with security clearances and background checks. Um, so for me, it was a year start to finish. Um, but it, you know, I was living in North Carolina and I, was, I just told my wife, like I'm miserable we're moving to DC. We're going to move to the epicenter and I'm just going to get closer to it. So I ended up doing consulting work um, for you know an army client. I went back to school and got another master's degree in DC, like whatever I could do to get me closer to people in this world, I wanted to do. And you know, I finally got picked up by the recruiter and it took a year to get in the door. But it, it was from childhood for me, like wanting to get into this world. You were kind of set up for it pretty well, too. I mean, with all this experience abroad, uh, you speak any foreign languages? No, at the time I didn't. So I got trained when I was there to pick up French. Okay. But, you know, growing, growing up, I took Spanish. Mm -hmm. um, when I was younger, you know, I could speak Flemish because we lived in Belgium. <laughs> but that was it. You know, I, I lost that. And not surprisingly, it's not a language that you really need <laughs> when you're at the agency. Did, did you have a desire... Look, with all the different jobs in the agency, did you have a specific focus? Did you want to get into aviation or operations or? So this this wore on me a little bit because, well, first of all, like many people, you don't know anything about the agency because it's so shrouded in secrecy. So I didn't know what the hell I was doing. They just said, hey, you're coming in. You're going to go do this job. Does that sound OK? And I was like, I'll go and mop floors and toilets for you if you will let me come into this building. <laughs> so I'll do whatever you want me to do to get my foot in here. But yeah, hell yeah, I'll go do ops. You're, you're, you're like Forrest Gump going through the farm. Oh, man. Like, oh, man. I, I do whatever like you tell me to, drill sergeant. Person. Yes, whatever you want me to do, I'm going to go do. <laughs> but yeah, there's, as you guys know very well, there's a paramilitary side to to the agency that's that's usually hunting down people who have any not any type of military like specific skills in aviation it's it's kind of rare to get a pilot in the agency because usually pilots want to fly and all they want to do is fly and they stay in and they have bonus structures set up to keep them in service flying so it's not often you get folks who are yeah when, when we first talked ryan I, I asked you i was like well were you an air branch like flying spooky undercover right. helicopters and you're like no as an ops guy like whoa polar opposite yeah no so for me, though, there, there was this like, God, I would love to go over to that side of the house and do that because I just loved I, I would have if I could have gone back to Afghanistan as a PMOO and, and, you know, like supported that mission again, like all the guys I had served with were back down range again. And I hated myself for not being there. Right. And I was thinking, God, I'm going to go somewhere and just watch this happen. So it's it it really wore on me. But their deployment cycle is rough. You know, it's a tough deployment cycle for those guys, and they're in, in difficult places. And I think a lot of them want to go and do traditional roles on the ops side so they can take a breath. So it's probably a blessing I didn't end up doing that, but it weighed on me heavily as I started out. There, sure. For sure. Yeah. So you, you went so you went into ops and you got accepted and you went to the farm, I assume, or... Yeah. And I should say, because you guys did introduce me as an ops officer. And if there are people who know me, they would say, no, 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 you weren't actually an ops officer. So I was a collection manager. So it's separate. We get trained in the same way as ops officers, but we have different roles. And folks will reach out to me who are you know, interested in getting into the agency. And we'll talk through some of this. And we can, because it's all on the website. Like I'm not giving away secrets here, but it's a different role where ops officers are out there meeting assets mm -hmm 
collecting intel. That is their job, like 100%. That's what they're working on. In my role, I was trained to do that, and I did that as part of my job. But the other part of my role was to understand for whatever issue I was assigned to, if we just say like, hey, you're working on terrorism, right? In this particular country, if we said Afghanistan. You know, my job is to understand where our sources are in Afghanistan on this target set. So I need to know where they are and what they have information and access to. And then I need to understand what the people who are reading that intel in the end, what they need to know. Mm -hmm. Like, what are their intel gaps? And then I need to close those gaps. So if somebody like a military customer or somebody on the policy side is thinking, what is what is the situation with this terrorist group in Afghanistan? It's my job to then go and say, hey, Bob, the ops officer, you're going out to meet with this guy. I know you, you got a meeting coming up. When you go meet with them, if you can only ask two questions, they need to be these two questions, mm -hmm. right? And they're going to know those for the most part. Like they're going to know these better than anybody. But I, it's my responsibility to be tied in with the customer, the consumer of the intel, to understand what they need and make sure that when that guy's going out, he knows this is what I'm asking for. If I have no time available, like I got to get this intel out. And then I help him produce the intel and get it back to the person who's reading it. So I'm, we can be in the, in the U.S. as a collection manager. You can be forward deployed in, in stations. I did both and I'm out there handling, but I'm also, I, I'm kind of like, almost like an editor in a newsroom, if you would imagine. And journalists are coming back with their copy, like, all right, here's what I got. And then I'm massaging it into this thing that it needs to look like as it goes out into the community. So when we often hear about problems in the intel community that the left hand isn't talking to the right hand, your job is to fix that. Yeah, uh, yes. But I would say that's, I think when people say that, it's more like, the bureau isn't talking with the agency, which right. isn't talking to mill. And so there is a little bit of that. Like I would be in touch with the people like me at those different mm -hmm. organizations, making sure we're, you know, if we're overlapping, which it can be okay that we're sharing that and that they know what we're doing and vice versa. So, so there's no disruption of ops. Like that's the last thing we want. And if we've already collected something there, we shouldn't waste anybody's time or risk anyone's life to go and collect it again. You know, so there's, there's a little bit of that. Mine is more making sure that the person who's reading the intel has what they need. So slightly different than the left and right talking to Did you ever, being that sort of managing, in that managing role, did you ever feel like the request you were getting from up top uh, or from the, the customers was uh, like that they were just ridiculous and didn't even know what they were asking for? I didn't. And actually, I might equate this as you were talking, Jack, about calling in Cobras. One of the things on the Army side as an aviator that I often noticed was when we would go and do fam fires, you know, with ground units, the guys getting on the radios talking to us were so afraid to talk to us right. as pilots. It was like, I'm going to mess something up. I got to have this like well-structured nine line because they've heard of a JTAC doing it. And we would tell them like we'd be in these briefing rooms with with squad leaders and team like, and we just say, guys, just talk to us. Just tell us like what you see, where you see it. Like we are super easy to work with. It's not like calling in a fast mover that needs all these different points. Right. And so the, the reason I bring that up is it's the same thing in my role when I'm at the agency and I'm talking to a consumer. It's like, you tell me what your like hopes and dreams are. We probably aren't going to be able to fill it but I need to know like exactly what you want. Don't hold anything back. Just tell me the intel you need and let me work on getting it for you. So, you know, I, I don't feel like I had anything outrageous in that respect. Right. And I will say one thing about the agency is their patience level is was completely unlike anything I saw in the military. Like ter CT work aside, so counterterrorism work, that has to be very quick. But when you're doing like traditional espionage work, you they have a very long time horizon and a lot of patience. So it's okay if you don't have intel right now, as long as you're getting there eventually. And I never expected that when I got in. I was That's just cool. used to like everything going 100 miles an hour right away. Right. right. What would, did you have or what were some of your biggest headaches as a CMO, whether they were kind of general or specific? I should say the CMO within that community has a bit of a stigma to it. 
right? So if I'm talking to folks who are in the agency and they're like, you were a CMO, they'd say, shouldn't you, what did you have like a cat next to you and you were knitting sweaters? Because <laughs> the origin of the CMO is they were typically spouses of case officers, of ops officers. Like that, I'm talking that's what Marty. Time. That's what Marty did. Well, Marty Peterson, who we interviewed before she joined the CIA as an operations officer, her husband was a paramilitary guy doing ops in Laos, and she was there as as his spouse with the index cards every yep. day, putting them in, putting the reports where they're supposed to go. Exactly. So oftentimes they were spouses writing up reports. So w when I came in, even there was this stigma, but what for whatever reason they hired a whole lot of like older military officers or senior enlisted to do this role like they were i don't know if they were trying to break it or they wanted people with you know war zone experience or whatever so there's definitely that stigma i should say so when it comes to headaches that's not a headache but i i would be remiss if i didn't touch on this because anybody who's a case officer would be like ah cmos <laughs> they're always busting my balls because guys would come in and jack i know you were a journalist so i don't know if you got this with editors but like they're coming in, like, look at this great intel I got. It's going to set the world on fire. And you're like, actually, they collected that over at this station yesterday. So <laughs> thanks for doing this, but it's not actually that important. Or good job. Th this this was written by, were, were you drunk when you wrote this? Like, why are you using, why would you talk like this? What about these details? So it was usually a, a healthy relationship of, between me and the case officer because they want every they think everything is going to be earth shattering and usually as a cmo we have to break some hard news to them about how it's really going to go down when it hits uh hits the press thank you for your service that's funny yeah exactly <laughs> exactly so did you have yeah. to sometimes massage egos like tell them hey it's great work it's just not needed uh, we're going to put this in the file in case somebody wants it someday yes there's a lot of that and and they know i mean a lot of case officers, they just, I think to be a good case officer, you have to have this mentality where these types, a setback doesn't hurt you. You know, like you got to be able to roll off almost like you're a goalie or something or a kicker where if you miss, it's okay. You got to get back up and move. And they, they almost have like a salesman type personality so they can mingle, chat someone up, be really affable and then get what they need and get on out. So oftentimes like, I'd say, hey, we got to change this up. And they take what I had to say pretty, pretty easily. But there are a couple of times somebody would say, no, this is how it is. It has to be this way. This is what he said specifically. I'm not going to try to interpret it. And that's important. And you want somebody to stick to their guns. So, you know, there's a there's a bit of tension there, but there needs to be. Mm -hmm. And it's it's OK. It's healthy. So Ryan, can you spill the tea? I mean, what can you say about your time at the agency? Where did, where did they send you? What were you doing? Tell us your secrets. Yeah, so uh, I was sent to Europe and Africa. That's all I can say. I was given French language, if you want to try to interpret. Okay. <laughs> um, my time, I guess I would say like, you know, the, the farm is training, you know, as we call it. I know you guys know what this is, but for those who are listening, and I know you've had a lot of folks on from the agency who are far more experienced than me. But the farm is, you know, it's kind of the the gauntlet for us in getting through into the community and being blessed off, right? So just speaking at a high level about that, I would say that thing is a mind game, in my opinion. You know, I've gone through SEER and flight school and all of this other stuff, but the farm was like another level of insecurity, you don't know what's going on. You cannot trust anyone at any time. Like everyone is paranoid. Anytime you're doing any act, you're like, oh my God, who's watching me? So they really beat it into you that you got to think through these things on your own. And I guess I would say coming from the military to this, because not everybody does at the agency. A lot of folks come straight out of college and they go right into this career. But coming from the military, where every time I went out, I at a minimum had my co-pilot, another aircraft. So there are at least four of us. And then we're usually supporting you guys on the ground. So there's, there's like a community of us when we're operating. At the agency, you're being trained to go out completely on your own, like 100%, no comms, off the grid. Like if you screw up, another human's life is at risk, right? The mm -hmm. asset is at risk. 
So that was a huge difference for me in coming from the military to this, like the, the, the level of responsibility, especially as you got guys coming out of college, guys and girls who are 25 doing this, mm. there's a lot of responsibility on your shoulders. So the farm, it doesn't cut a ton of people the way it's not like buds or, or ranger school for you guys, but there's, there's a, a significant triaging process and vetting process just to get there. So I think they weed out a lot of folks to get to that point. And then when you get to the farm, I mean, it's ruthless. Just um, there, there is no, again, no A plus. It's either you suck or you did fine and you can go to the next round. And they do, they do these cuts that are merciless. And one is on the very last day and you've been there a long time. And there are people who just get cut and they don't tell you why. And there are people you've been with for months now who are, who are packing it up and going home. And oftentimes what I noticed was it was folks who were having trouble and didn't want to talk about it in the group, right? So, and you probably saw this, I'm sure, when you guys were going through selection and some of the different courses you went through. If you don't have the self-awareness and the humility, I think, to just show where you're weak and, and take on other people's advice, you're not going to make it and they will see it and they will cut you. Was there anybody that was cut on the last day that you were just – surprised or shocked yeah um there was a person who was going to be basically the intel rep for dev grew you know we just assume 100 percent this person's getting through we had a senior fairly senior marine officer quit during the course which blew my mind i just didn't even think that was in the dna and i've seen people not, not just get cut but quit where I never would have thought someone would quit. But it, I think the the older you get, the harder it is to go through these right, right. types of games. Yeah. You know, like it's a game in the end, not a game. That's not fair because it, it's good training. I will say I, I wasn't in the units you guys were in in the military. I was always conventional, but I had never been through such realistic training as I was at at the agency. Like never. It was ne not even Sear was close to this. So they put a lot into it. But they needed to because of the type of work you're going to do on the back end. Did, did uh, you have the opportunity to run any any agents in the field? I did. Yeah. So I handled I handled uh, human assets uh, a few times again because I was a CMO. It was like, hey Ryan, as you have time, you can go do this. So very much like being an officer in the aviation community. Quite honestly, where your job is not really to fly. Your mm -hmm. job is to do officer things, like make sure that everybody has the right size boot when you deploy as, as painful as that is and making sure the battle space is operating in a certain way and you're, you're liaising, right? So as a CMO, my job was to stay in touch with analysts at headquarters and understand what policymakers needed and then know what our stable of assets was. But whenever something came up, when there was an op, I was like, hell, fucking throw me into that. So you know, over time, you build up a reputation and they'll start throwing cases your way. So mm -hmm. I did get a chance to handle several cases. And to me, that was the real deal. And mm -hmm. I will say, just like my first time flying outside the wire where um, I was thinking, like, it's going to be World War Three here. <laughs> the first time you're cruising around on your own, like you're in regular clothes, you have no comms, you're in in a vehicle you've never really been in before. And you think the KGB and, is going to pull you into a panel? Oh, band. dude. Yeah. <laughs> you got like mosques going off. You're stopping because of goats crossing the road. You're questioning everything. Yeah. Like the amount, you're just so on edge for that. You're like that was the real deal for me was doing those types of ops. It's funny because you don't have to be paranoid, but when you're doing like an SDR or something like that, and you, when you're new, it looks like everybody's looking at you. Everyone. Right? It's like, oh, this Everyone. person's like, like, everybody is looking at me. Yeah. Any funny stories about, you know, sources making uh, sexual passes at you or I don't, I don't know, anything <laughs> anything funny? or we, We've heard some pretty good ones yeah. uh, in, the, in past episodes. I will say, to your point, David, of to try to kind of like knock the paranoia off of you when you're going through that training, they'll, they'll show you videos of people changing clothes in broad daylight down like a New York street. And they'll, it'll just be somebody walking around and they change their whole outfit. 
and nobody even gives them a second look. Right. You know, and they're like, this is what is going on around you. You never even see. Right. And so they, they just try to break that mentality for you as, as you're going through doing like just learning how to do SDRs and making sure you're not being followed. Right. And then you're taking down all kinds of license plate numbers. Like, did I see that one before? Did they switch that out? Like, can you write that down while you're driving and not crash? Like, are you paranoid? And they just, the, the more you do it, the more familiar you get. And every, I feel like almost everybody gets it. A few folks maybe don't, but for the most part, you get it over time. Some get it quicker than others. Yeah. On the funny, on the funny side of things, let me see. No, um, no, so no sexual passes, which should not be surprising. However, there, one of the ways I had to get to meetings at one point in time required me to get massages along the way. <laughs> so it, it was pretty, it was pretty unreal. Um, so, you know, I, I go in, I pay in cash. I had to make a stop here to, I had to sell something. Basically I had to make sure that it, people understood why I was in a certain area. So I would get massages. And so I would roll into these meetings like with oil all over me, all over. My hair's all slicked back. Like I'm glistening. You know, I look like I was just using Manscaped basically. Like I just come out of that. Um, and then another time, you know, not, not that it was sexual, but I was debriefing someone in, there were three of us and we all didn't speak a common language. So I was speaking French, who was, who was translating French to Arabic and coming back to, to this other guy in mm -hmm. Arabic who was coming back to me in French. And, and then you're having to translate the of, into English in your mind. Oh, and then I have to write in English, like the amount of time it takes to ask a single question when you have this telephone game going on, even when you have time available, it's crazy. Like those are some of the things you find yourself doing. Like, this, like, this is what I signed up for. It's awesome. I, I loved that. I loved it. Every second of so it. So having the government pay for your massages. <laughs> That's right, man. Those things are expensed. Your tax yeah. dollars hard at work, work folks. You, you heard it here first. <laughs> uh, so what what was it? You had some pretty good trips, it sounds like, with the agency and learning your job and, and having a good time doing it. Why did you end up leaving? It was so hard for me to leave that place. Even the bureaucracy of it, I loved it. I, I loved everything about that place. So in the military, I didn't have the same impression. I enjoyed being downrange. Like when I was out flying in combat i loved it but the garrison environment in the military i didn't like yeah. at the agency even if you're at headquarters which is kind of like being banished to siberia everybody wants to be out in the field in stations but even at headquarters like every day you're dealing with front page news like the issue of the day and what's going on and and you're you're reading about stuff that's happening that just blows your mind amazing ops right so for me, it was really tough to leave, but I'm married to an attorney who has a, a great career and moving every two years is not easy. I have uh -huh. three boys. The oldest is 14. When we moved here to California for my last job, he had moved 11 times. So to me, it was a little bit of, all right. And, and I do like, I, I would ask you guys the same question. Like for me, I feel like I am one of maybe 5% of the human population that's gotten to do the job that they love to do. Uh -huh. You know, even though I only did it for eight years, I wouldn't pass that up for anything else. And at some point I felt like I had to, to move on and put, put some other people's lives ahead of mine. Uh -huh. But I would ask you guys if you feel that way about your time in service. Yeah, it was like, like a little kid that wants to be an astronaut. I got to walk on the moon, you know, that's how it feels like. So, yeah. uh, but like you, I, I felt like it, I did the right thing enlisting and doing the job. But when I got out, it was also the right time for me to get out. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I agree. Like I, I lived pretty much every dream I had. Um, and also like you, and one of the things we've talked about before is, you know, there, there's this idea of thank you for your service, but everything that we did ultimately would there, it, I'm not saying we didn't want to serve, but there was also a sort of a selfish intent behind it. We did it because we wanted to, like we were living out our dreams. And yeah, at a certain point, <clears throat> you know, you have to wonder if the people in your life, if that's fair to them. Sure. Um, and, you know, uh, like, you know, and you have to make 
decisions based on other people. Yeah. So I, I still miss it to this day. Like I'd take anything to go back and, and do that, but you know, it's a one way door. You can't go back in there. Right. Right. Well, and, and the other thing is, is you did leave for a reason. And even though you miss yep. it, that reason wouldn't change. If you went back and like started living again, then the other, then the people you're attached to would also go back to, Oh no, I'd be divorced. That's yeah. how it would go down. So yeah, the only yeah, thing yeah. I like more than the agency is my wife. So yeah, let's uh, let's hit up some uh, viewer questions, and then we'll talk about you know getting out in your your kind of post service life and combat story and what you're up to now. Um. So Dickie, thank you very much. I uh, said great guest looking at his background and great guest. Yeah, absolutely. I think he meant the background of you know your your I I love me wall. Um. But, That's right. Yeah. I, the I was cool once, Wall. Yeah. 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 Uh, I mean, we all have them. Um, uh, Jackson, thank you. Ryan, did you ever work with uh, Brown Branch or Special Activities? What were your experiences like with them? Also, did you have any interest in maybe trying out for them? And we talked about that a little bit. I did. Yeah. So I, I worked with them and there were days when I was at the agency where there, there's one guy that kind of controls their pipeline and because I had this aviation background, like I was a really good fit and I very easily could have walked in there. And this guy, I mean, he's been around a long time. He's good reputation. So it was hard for me not to join, but again, like I would have been away from the family and, and I wouldn't have had this experience that I did. So I elected not to do that. And I often wish that I did, but I worked with those guys and I was impressed as hell with them. Like it's a really great crop of, of officers. I mean, from where they came from, they, I think the impression is they all come from Delta, but that's not the case at all. Like you got different special operators, you got a lot of Marines in there. They mm -hmm. just, for whatever reason, they do great work in this place and seeing them operate both in the PMO role. And then when they go over to traditional case officer roles, every you know few, few um, cycles, you know, they do great work. And some of some of my best friendships were with those guys, I would say. And they, they're crazy. They get to do some crazy stuff. One guy was like, he, he rolled into his very nice apartment in this part of the world and had his like parachute gear. You know, like I sure as hell was not doing anything like that. And I thought that was super cool. Um, RD, thank you very much. He said, uh, 810 was my weapon system, avionics engineer. Uh, that's uh, smart guys there. Uh, and Jackson, thank you again. Is there a soft uh, slash CT unit member that you haven't interviewed covered yet that you really want to? And he said also, thanks for all the work you, yeah. Jack and Dave. Did. Yes. So from, from my podcast, basically mm -hmm. from combat story. Yeah. Yeah. So I will say every single person who leaves a comment asked me to interview Pat Mack. So I don't know if you guys have interviewed him or not, mm -mm. but I have not. So it, actually he taught a shooting course to my brother's company once. And that's the first time I heard of him. And that, uh, I would love to interview him just for many reasons, but he, he's great. I, think, I, I interviewed him on a, on a previous podcast years ago. He, oh. He's, he's really good. He's a really good guy. Yeah. He just seems like it. So I think, I think that's out there, but I would say, and, and just, David, just to make sure you were saying a soft guy or a non-soft guy. Is there a soft or sleet team member? But really, we can open this up. Is yeah. there anybody? So my the the number one person I want to interview is the guy who wrote No Easy Day. Um, so the guy who was number two in the stack to kill Bin Laden. Uh, I think his when he published the book, which the Navy did not authorize, I think the name was like Matt Bissonette. Bissonette, yeah. So I loved that book. I, I just really enjoyed the way it was written. I mean, it goes into like getting into dev grew. It shows the conventional, whatever, the, the non-dev grew seal life progression. And then I think he comes back from this op from killing Bin Laden. And he goes to a Taco Bell drive through like in his pickup truck. He's got his country music on. He, he cruises up. He gets his Taco Bell. Like 24 hours before that, he's he's in Afghanistan, Pakistan, killing UBL. Mm -hmm. So I just there was something about that that I thought was so amazing, so and I would real. love to interview that guy. 
was there for you when you did your combat tour as a helicopter pilot and then coming back to the States, was there a decompression period for you? Was there a, a like a sort of this surreal juxtaposition thing, time for you? I mean, I had a lot of trouble coming back and I had lived in a lot of these places. I mean, we were, we were in Afghanistan. I spent four years of my life in Pakistan. So like I knew this place. I almost fired a hellfire. Like, I think I fired one into Pakistan, actually. So if we want to regroup on that one day, we can. <laughs> yeah. So, no, it's all good. It's all recorded. So we couldn't get away from it. Um, but yeah, coming back was tough for me. I think so. I had a, a, a year old son at the time that day where I thought I was going to die, like, you know, th that meant a lot to me. I came back and I, I wrote an email to a friend of mine, my best man at my wedding. And I said, Hey man, I don't know if I'm going to make it back. Like make sure that Owen, my son, like grows up to be like a normal kid and does all right and look out for him. Like I had just resigned myself that I might not make it. So coming back, I think I still had that in my head and my wife noticed it immediately. Like she has known me since we were 15. She's seen me do everything stupid. I've ever done. She's seen it. She knows me so well and she saw it right away. And for years I was like, nah, there's nothing going on until it really got bad. So I would say we had a couple days of decompression, David, but it was, you know, I, I didn't do well coming back. And how long did it take you? Or it, I mean, how did you deal with that process? Do you feel like you've, you've come back from it? Poorly. I dealt with it poorly is the answer. So early on, like it came to a breaking point where my wife just said, hey, you're going to see someone or we're done. Mm -hmm. And I will say like, this is an interesting part about the agency. The hardest training I ever went through, like bar none, was an advanced course at the agency. Like it's very small classes and incredibly intense. I was in there with like a MARSOC GB guy and he was, he said to me, he goes, I would go through ranger school. And he, he had done ranger school. He's like, I would go through ranger school three times before I do this again. It was just soul crushing. And at the time, like my wife, I came, it was all from your home, which made it even worse. Like it wasn't even, you were deployed or gone. You were coming home at night and not helpful at all. And my wife was just crying like, Hey, I need help here. And I left, you know, I was like, no, I got this thing to do. You know, like that's what my headspace was at the time until right. she just put her foot down I went and got help. I saw a psychologist and I, I, I will say like, I know you guys interviewed uh, Greg Coker, who's awesome. And you did a fantastic job at that interview. I ended up interviewing him after seeing your guys interview with him, but like he is the, the pinnacle for me. Like he was a little bird gun pilot. You know, he flew Cobras and Apaches and to hear him talk about PTSD. I hated, like, I would never in my life have said to guys like you, I could have had PTSD because I wasn't kicking down doors. But to hear a guy like Greg say it, I feel more comfortable doing right, it. Right, right. Um, so I dealt with it, man. And I know, like, I would never hold that against any other pilot. If they had it, I would right. never hold it against them. But we, that's just how all of us are. We right. feel like we're, we weren't Delta guys, so we can't have PTSD. So I definitely, I dealt with it. I'm in a great spot now. But I hid that thing from the agency as I went in, for sure. Yeah. Now, when you were going through that process, I, uh, were you cool with the first psychologist you found or did you sort of have to shop to find somebody who you felt rapport with? So I went in, I did the, I did the VA's program, which I mean, I, I don't know if you guys went through this at all. You don't have to talk about it, but you know, it takes a while to get into the pipeline. So I was really lucky that I had a paying job where I could pay my own way to get a psychologist in the meantime. So I found someone local who worked out and then I went and did like a, eight week VA program, just one-on-one, -on -one, which was really helpful. And to this day, like probably changed everything for me. But then I, I went back to this local psychologist who I stayed with for a couple of years, quite honestly. And I, I will say, and I'd be interested to hear your guys take on it. But for me, I was an extremely high functioning person at work and a train wreck at home because of this. Yeah. Yeah. I definitely became that. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Yeah. I, and I, I, I mean, I don't, I think everybody like manifests or deals with it differently. I think avoidance is a, is a common thing, you know, the, where we the just work start avoiding. The workaholic mentality is a way to oh, avoid yeah. it too. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. No, I, I think it's really common. And, and I think that, you know, it's funny that you say that as a pilot, because you weren't kicking in doors, like it, it would be hard to say that, but even 
I think if you were to, you know, talk to guys and Delta or whatever, it would always be, well, these people had it worse. So who am I? Right, right. Like there's always that next notch where you're always like, well, yep. this, this isn't, you know, um, yeah, it's, it's just one of those things. So, so where did combat store, like, where did you go from there? So when we decided we were, we as a family, like, Hey, I'm getting out of this lifestyle. We got to find something else. It took me a long time to wrap my head around. What am I going to do next? And one of the cool things about the agency is you go visit some really cool places. So I was in a unique, really nice resort um, in between ops. And I was just sitting there looking at this amazing view and writing down, like I took a whole day just sitting there writing out what, what else could I go do? And I thought if I could just sit around and talk to folks who did this, who were in it, like no shit in it and what it was like for them, I'd be happy. Like I could do that for the rest of my life. And I know you guys do that. So, you know, you get it, you understand it. And so that's what I wanted to do. So I asked the agency if I could do it. They said I could, I could record these things, but I couldn't air them. So until I was out. So I did oh, I three got interviews, got out. And then a year after I was gone, I was able to release these things. So I've, I've kind of went into it full on after that. So I started it in 2017, but didn't release my first one until November of 2020. Wow. And, and how, who was your first guest? So my first guest was Elliot Ackerman. And I, I don't know if you guys have interviewed him or not. Have you guys mm-hmm. interviewed him? He So he's, he's written several best-selling books, but he was a Marine. He was a Marine officer, MARSOC, and then he was a PMOO. And it, he did all of that in eight years. So real tight grouping, but he was a platoon leader in Fallujah too, as a Marine. And he went down to like 50% strength on his first 24 hours. Like he's on a rooftop and half his platoon is wiped out, like literally combat ineffective. And, and it was, it was funny cause we met up and I was like, Hey, I'm actually at the agency. And he's like, Oh, funny. Cause I was too. And we went into a hotel room cause it was before zoom stuff. It was like, we were doing an asset. Like I had little food set out. So he felt comfortable <laughs> and to, you know, it was in person. We recorded it, um, but it was it was audio only. But I just I got hooked on it. And the second guy I interviewed was this dude I was talking about, JT Snow, who's this warrant officer. And and that was almost like a release for me to hear him say, hey, the worst day I ever had in 4000 hours of flying were the same 10 hours I was with you. You know, like that meant a lot to me to hear it from a guy who was that seasoned. Right. Yeah. That's fascinating. We I missed one question I want to get to. Uh, Jim G8, thank you very much. He said, how much do you miss flying? Have you considered trying to get National Guard or reserve flight slots? So I don't miss it that much. And I will say this is interesting about the flight community, the aviation community. When you go up for the first day that you fl- you're you in the air the first time, for a lot of guys and girls, it is a monumental day in your life. Like you've been watching aircraft since you were five. You just want to get up there. For me, and there are, there are others like me. For me, the only reason I wanted to be there was to support guys on the ground. Like, mm-hmm. to, how can I get to the front line to help these guys as quickly as possible? So I didn't have a love of flying as much as I did. I just wanted to be where the action was. So I, I don't have that love. But I will say my 14-year-old wants to fly, and I would love to be the one who teaches him to fly. So... I'm trying to use my GI Bill to get back in and get an instructor pilot certification, but it's hard when you've got PTSD. So I will say, like, I didn't realize that it makes sense. They don't really want you flying. So there's a lot of hoops you got to jump through. So it's a while before I do that. Do you, out of curiosity, do you think that sort of the, the stigma around post-traumatic stress and like, like you just said, it's kind of hard when you have PTSD do you think that those types of issues, those types of stigmas make guys or make people, I should say, make people reluctant to come forward for treatments if they're going to get a diagnosis? Yeah, I do. I think it's more, my opinion, I think it's more acceptable now for us to say to each other that we have it. Where 15 years ago, I think we wouldn't say, like Mm -hmm. the three of us probably wouldn't say much about that. But so I think in that setting, it's more acceptable to, to talk about it. But I will say, even at the agency or the military, I think there's still a fear that if you say you have that, if it's found out, you're yeah. coming off you're done. The, the line. 
right. like nobody wants to go sit at like, if you're doing the jobs we were doing nobody wants to go sit at a desk right and that's where where you're going to get put so i don't know how you square that but i will say and jack you mentioned it like you can be highly functioning and focused at work with this yeah. it's just you have other things where where you need the outlet so i think there's a happy medium but right now i think people are still reluctant to admit that they have it because they're afraid they won't get to do what they want to do right and i think a lot of that i mean and i'm a little bit older and like in the 70s and 80s there there was this thing about post-traumatic stress with vietnam veterans and they would on tv or in the movies it would be like they would go they would go crazy oh it was mel gibson sitting on the houseboat holding a beretta to his head looking at the picture of his dead wife that's like how we thought of ptsd well and, sure. and before that it was like somebody like snap having flashbacks and snapping in flashbacks. the office yeah. you know right and, up, and and not, up at a bell tower and not being yeah. able to differentiate their flashback from reality um and that's you know not the case um no but but uh Brad Oric asks, interesting thing you found out about your guests. Like, what are some of the most surprising things you found out? Yeah, so I will say, I'd be curious to hear this from you guys as well. For the tier one operators, one of the consistent themes I've seen, there, there are two. And one of them is visualization techniques, which I did not expect to see. And a different kind of no quit mentality. So almost every one of them I've interviewed, right? So Dev Grew or, or Delta or, or whatever, will say that they had these visualization techniques where they sit down and think through operations or how something's gonna go and what they'll do to react, whether it's CQB or, I don't know. But I've definitely heard professional athletes do it. Mm -hmm. And so it doesn't surprise me that they do it. Mm -hmm. But that I've heard it from almost every one of them and not just the tier one, like, you know, Jack and, and David, I'd be curious if you guys saw it where you were because you guys were in, in the elite communities as well. Was this something that was taught to you guys from psychologists? Not, ta not taught. Definitely no. not. But, but I think it's something that like, uh, like snipers for sure think through the shots and mm -hmm. visualize it like before you're going out onto the range or as you're going out onto the range. I think there's some of that internal vis visualization, but, and, and they probably should train guys to do that sort of, that sort of thing. I'm sure there, I'm sure there's some sort of benefit there. Yeah. And I remember, Oh, go ahead. Dave. No, go no, ahead. I, no, go ahead. I, I was just going to say that I think visualization kind of comes naturally, like even at CQB, like you, you, right. you know, you, especially after a run, if you didn't do it well, you like you, you, see yourself doing it well, you know, over and over again, even if you're just kind of beating yourself up about, oh man, I, you know, but you're still seeing, you're, you're still working that process. And the way that some of the instructors work too, is they're trying to like put you in that position, like, like the walkthrough phase of it. So you can visualize right. it. Like this is what the right way looks like, you know? Right. Yeah. I love hearing that. It, I, and I haven't done that often, but I remember like there's there's a key phase in flight school where you do instrument training. So you're only using instruments to fly around. It can be pretty tough. And I really did that before that particular exercise. I got like a 98 or 99 on it. It's unheard of, just mm -hmm. very rare. And I, I just thought through all of these scenarios. So I can see the value in it. And I almost wish I could bring it out in mm -hmm. corporate America. Like, how do I do that for my day? How do I ramp up for a meeting I'm going to have on Zoom? Right, you know, right. Like, Right. I don't know how you visualize that, but right. I'd love to do that. Um, but the other one was this no quit mentality. And I think, I don't mean to be cliche about it, but some of these guys I've talked to have just said, yeah, you know, like I'm in selection. This other guy's about to quit. And, I, and I'm thinking to myself, like, you're going to have to pull me out of here with my cold, dead hands before I quit on this thing. Yeah. It's like another level of that. And and I've just felt it in all of these interviews with these folks. Well, it's interesting because and we've talked about this with previous guests too, that for most, for, I think for most people going through a selection, like quitting isn't even an option. Like selection is just the thing you do to get the job you want. It's not like this big obstacle. I mean, you want to train up for it and you want to be ready for it, but like quitting is never, it's like, it's like quitting on your commute to work. It's like, oh, the drive's too long to get to work. I'm not going to do it. But that's what like quitting a selection would feel like. It's like yeah. uh, this is this is just the commute to get to my job, you know. 
Uh, folks, I just want to remind everyone out there, please uh, like the video, subscribe to the channel. Down in the description, you can find a link to our Patreon if you want to support us. Uh, check us out on Instagram. Uh, what, what am I missing, Dave? At the Oh, definitely check out Ryan uh, Combat Story on YouTube and also probably every podcast. Instagram. Yep. Yeah. Yep. On on all the other audio. What's audio your content. what's your Instagram uh, title handle? At at Combat Story. And at Combat Story. Ryan, what uh, as we start kind of wrapping it up here, what is uh, how has Combat Story evolved, and where do you see it going into the future? What what do we have? What do you have in store for us? So, I mean, first of all, I really enjoy the team ass genuinely, and the fact that you Thanks, guys man. are talking not just to to operators, but also on the Intel side, law enforcement, like I, I really appreciate that angle. And I've had a lot of trouble personally breaking into the Intel space because it's so hard to talk about some of these things. Mm -hmm. It's just so sensitive, you know? So I do know one day I will go down that road and talk to, th those are my favorite stories are hearing folks who are at the agency and these things that they've done. And a lot of them will never come out. They can't, um, but I do, I do see that at some point but I, I, I suspect for me, it, it'll be more, it's, it's my outlet to stay connected to the veteran community. Um, and I think what I was surprised about with this, I'd be interested to hear your guys take from the team house. The, the comments that I get from people who are reaching out about hearing these stories from others and how it helps them like get through tough times, I didn't yeah. really expect, quite honestly. And I think that's really cool. So I think as long as people still feel that way about it, I'll still do this. Yeah. Yeah. I've definitely, uh, we've received comments like that. Or we've received comments like uh, uh, viewers also feel like it's a way for them to stay connected to the veterans community. I even had uh, a gold star father reached out to us at one point and said, I feel closer to my son who was killed in combat through, oh, watching, through watching this show and hearing these stories. I'm like, I don't, I don't even know how to respond to something like that. Yeah. How, I mean, that's super sad, but how great is that that you guys had that impact on someone's life? You know? Yeah, it, it meant something to somebody in a way that I Hell can't yeah. even that I can't even really comprehend. You know, and, and yeah. we just want to say we love your show too, and and we really if if you guys have not checked out Combat Story, do so. You if if you enjoy the Team House, yeah. you're gonna you're gonna enjoy Combat Story. Like you will love it, Ryan. You're a, a phenomenal host. Um, yeah. You know, you ask great questions. <laughs> yeah. Really? If I can, Jack. Um, so Jack was our, our episode 13, which I thought was hilarious based on Murphy's Law, like <laughs> lucky 13. But some of the comments I got on that one, like, God damn, you keep interrupting him. We just want to hear Jack talk. So uh, maybe one day, Jack, you'll let me do a round two and with you. I I'd love to talk about the journalist work he did, too. Sure, sure. There's definitely a lot to get in there. No, I'd, I'd be happy to. Um, and like Dave said, if people like the team house, they should go and check out Combat Story. They should go yeah. see go see what Ryan's doing over there. And like, I guarantee you, you're going to find something there you're interested in. Uh, if you mention uh, in the comments that you're from the team house or that you you got there from the team house, Ryan will give you, you a you'll discount get a 20% on discount something. on Combat Story. <laughs> on something. Yeah. On something. yeah. Not to be determined. So uh, aside from Combat Story, is there anything else that you're working on? Any other passions that you're pursuing? So I do want to give back a little bit more to the veteran community. And I've spent the past two and a half years at at Google at a big tech company running an Intel team. And I work in this space that's called trust and safety. And I had never heard of it when I was leaving the agency. And I think for a lot of people who come out of military, Intel, law enforcement, you go into corporate America and you're looking for something that has meaning where you're doing good work and you're fighting bad actors. And I didn't really think it was out there and I found it. So I'm in it now. Like I, I don't work at Google anymore. I left there and I'm going to another big tech company here in, in a month. But I want to help get veterans into that to help them fill that void. So That's I am cool. working on something in that capacity. It's not related to combat story, but it's more just related to people who are in, in a spot like me and, and places where they want to do more and they don't think they can. But there's a whole world out there that just probably haven't seen yet. Yeah. Super no, cool. That's fascinating. Uh, and next episode, we are going to have uh, Ken Gaudet in studio. Ken was a uh, LERP in Vietnam, 
and then he went and served with the Rhodesian Light Infantry, and then he served in 44 Pathfinder Company with another previous guest of ours, Peter McAleese, um, in South Africa. So Ken is a super interesting guy. We'll have him here in studio, uh, and it's going to be a little earlier. We're going to be live around um, 11 or noon, so it's not going to be at night. It's, a, it's an odd time for us because we're working around Ken's schedule. Uh, before he has to catch a flight out. But that will be next Friday. And I'll be on Ryan's show tomorrow. Uh, it'll be released tomorrow. That's right. And then who are yep. who are your next guests, a couple guests coming up? So I, I've i run several interviews recently that were teeing up. I got a uh, Swedish citizen of Kurdish descent who lost his uncle and cousins to ISIS in Syria and just picked up and left and went in to fight. And it's pretty interesting so I did two sessions with him about going through villages that had just been um, vacated by ISIS. And it's horrible what, what he kind of saw. I also just interviewed um, my first, uh, this is terrible of me, the first time I've interviewed a female guest, Kim Casey Campbell, a badass A-10 fighter pilot. That's awesome. Oh, that's Her awesome. sign, Casey is killer chick. <laughs> which I think is one of the coolest damn call signs I've ever heard. And she got hit with a SAM in Iraq and made it back to base. It's oh, awesome. she's, so, the, she's the one that put it down safely after getting hit. Yeah. That's her. Yeah. Oh, wow. It's awesome, man. She's, you guys should definitely have her on if you, if you haven't already. Um, just super accomplished, very yeah. understated and a badass. Yeah. Yeah. So, I, yeah I've, I got I've heard of coming. her. Yeah. That's awesome. That's awesome. Well, so, not appreciate it, guys. Yeah, thank you, Ryan. Really appreciate you spending your Friday evening with us, and you know, apologies to uh, your family as we keep you out here tonight. Uh, we no, got one last donation. Sorry, we got one last donation. Thank you, Quo Vadis, um, and thank you, Ryan. Man, we really appreciate your time, ah, guys. I appreciate your time, and uh, hopefully, we'll get around to with you all uh, someday. Yeah. Actually, I would like to talk to you guys just about your thoughts on your podcast one time, the two of you together, less on the stories, more on like putting this together, who you want to get on, like underrated episodes, one you've really enjoyed. I think your fans would really appreciate it. The, the whole background on how this thing came into existence. It's like such a, clus That's right. it's such a clusterfuck. It's, it's hilarious. That's, everybody wants to know that. Man. <laughs> yeah. 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 How do you, how do you get a successful podcast? I don't know, man. You just start talking and you keep talking, right? <laughs> <laughs> what, what what in the world possessed you to do it live instead of pre-recorded? Like, these are all Amen. In, yeah important questions. Uh, yeah. I'm still trying to resolve in my own mind. Yeah, we'll have to do uh, like a, a, a shared thing that we do on both of our channels. That'd be fun. That'd yeah, be fun. that would be cool. Well, all right, Ryan. Thank you, man. I appreciate it, and thank you everyone out there who joined us live. Our first comment comes from Dan Higgins on YouTube, and it's about the Tom Satterley interview. For those who don't recall, Tom Satterley is, of course, former uh, Sergeant Major in Delta Force, who runs the All Secure Foundation today. Dan says, love the podcast. Keep up the great interviews. One of the things I like is you give a description of who you're interviewing and what branch of service they were in, along with more, more details about the person. No other podcast I've seen do that. So for the people who haven't been in the military, it gives them an insight into whom you'll be talking to. I don't know why all military podcasts don't do that. They should adopt this just like you're doing keep it going ryan i really appreciate it i often wonder if people even listen to that section uh, maybe it's a one-off here but I, I appreciate you taking the time to share that dan um, i do want people to have some context for who we're getting into and and what they went through maybe the number of deployments where they served some other interesting pit, bits about them so glad it, it landed with you and i hope uh, other people feel the same thanks our second comment is also from a YouTube listener, uh, CT. And this is about Eric Miares, who of course has recently come out of the shadows. He spent a long career, also former Sergeant Major, in the tier one community, more on the Intel side. And uh, this comment made me laugh. It's short, but it says, this dude's ERB must be 20 pages long. So the ERB is basically a record of all the stuff you did while you were in service. And Eric, as you look at his, just some of his, his ribbons, how long he was in and the units he was in, you can just tell he's been through a whole lot of training courses. Um, 
And so, yeah, I think it would be pretty funny to see. And there are a few folks that come to mind. If you've served, you know these folks who have been to a ton of schools, racked up a ton of badges, their time down range. It all adds up. So uh, that one made me laugh. Thanks for leaving it, CT. And you all stay safe.